tell them where, tell them where. Shadow on beat, by the way. Let's get into it. You learn about cultural diffusion, pre-exilic practices from y'all students. Woo! Found them on the people residing in West Africa. Libations, live right marriages, ancestor veneration for the taking, cultural liberation, research application, redeeming Israel as the greatest. Yeah. Return it to the menological calendar before exile, before the Lord challenged us, before the 70 years in Babylon. Way before the Philistines worship they gone. Autonomous ways of wrecking the time. The Gregorian and Canada need to be left behind. Big up to my brother Divine, yo. Holy yeah. The place to learn our Hebraic language. Restoring our culture through the lens of the ancients. Restoring our people at food, shelter, and raiment. Community based driven desires for the taking. Ask a man to patronize one another. Never to hate Esau, for he is our brother. The intelligent excel in numbers. Only yeah. Word minutes the call to be given the word. Breaking down Hebrew grammar, nouns and verbs. Get the chorus online, click and learn. Gotta show us up approved till y'all returns. 4419, yo, Amdale Drive. Tucker GA, got your seat way to the side. Shabbat service, stay on fire. Only yeah. Where we have a home friendly neighborhood attorney Word. Developing alternative styles to stay worthy Cleaned up from the ground, came in the door dirty Word. What's the verdict? Catch the podcast early RBG Hebrews, we left and we back again Cultivate the resources to better our environment Less arguing, more inspiring, only yeah That's it That's it This the wrong Hey yo, for more information, hit up Kingdom Harbinger at gmail.com. Now to get you plugged in, shout out to Brother Divine, Brother Frank, Minister Carl, who's a Yahoo, we'll see you, man. The whole crook, whole crook. Stand up. Okay, okay. All right. What's going on, family? What's going on? This is your brother, Divine Prospect of Kingdom Harbinger Ministries. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the two tunes there. Uh, the first one that played is called the KHM Anthem, and that's on our um, The Truth Works Mixtape Volume 1. And then the second one is from none other than Son of Shemites, who is there in the building with us tonight. 
and that is on our The Truth Works mixtape volume two. If you're interested in either of these mixtapes, feel free to email us at kingdomharbinger at gmail.com. And we'll go ahead and I'll make sure that we take care of you guys. All right. So I want to thank everybody for joining in, man. Hope you guys are going to enjoy this show. We have a very special show for you on tonight. Uh, yes, I know it was pretty last minute, but I'm sure it'll be worth it. I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Um, and it'll definitely bring some edification to the community that is much needed. All right. All right. So I'm going to get started in one second. Uh, let me go ahead and just make sure that all the housekeeping is done on this end. Um, I need for you guys to hit the uh, one button if you can hear me and see me clearly. If you can hear me, see me clearly with no issues, please hit that one button. I want to make sure that there's no lag in, there's no audio and visual sync issues. All right. So just please hit that one button so I know that y'all are tuning in. You can hear it and see it well. And everything is going as planned. All right. Want to make sure everything's going as planned. All right. Everybody's hitting one. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So everybody that's joined in, please hit that thumbs up button. Please hit that thumbs up button. All right. Please hit that thumbs up button. Please hit that thumbs up button, family. All right. Um, what I also did was, as you can see on the ticket below, I added contact information as well as support information. If anybody's interested as we go along on the show, that way you don't have to ask me or the admins or mods as we're going through the show, the communication information is there. All right. Um, also, I had dropped a new book on our Patreon, www.patreon.com backslash divine prospect. And that one is on Halakha. OK, I want to make sure that you guys are thoroughly familiar with what Halakha is. We're also going to bring it out in this discussion with me and the brother Yim Yahu. We're going to discuss that uh, as one of the uh, major points that we're going to uh, tackle on today. And I just want to make sure that you guys are also aware of it. And that's what we do on the Patreon. We give you guys tons of resources for you to research. And we also show you guys what our research methodology is. Remember, uh, we also coming out with our KHM uh, Holistic Research Paradigm uh, series so we can teach you how to do uh, proper Bible study. All right. For those of you who are interested in that, um, we're going to be dealing with language, going to be dealing with culture, customs, history, um, geography, um, you know, climatology um uh geology if you want to look at it like that um we're going to deal with uh anything that uh you know botany or zooarchaeology anything that deals with understanding the text within its proper context um, we're going to be able to show you guys what sources to go to and the approach to take so you can get the most out of your bible studies uh, whether you're studying tanakh or whether you're studying the Bible harasha uh, whatever it is we're going to make sure that we give you the tools so whatever time you could devote that you guys can definitely extract the most out of your study, okay? Um, so again, if you are a Patreon member, uh, you would get access to this at no additional cost, and it will be a small fee for those who want to sign up, so that way we can take those resources and invest them and bring more resources to the study. And remember, it, it, we could be in class six, you know, you could be brand new jumping in, and it'll be like you never missed anything, all right? And this is by popular demand. You know, I had this class I was doing in 2014-15, um, and I've since suspended it from there. I think I, I started it again in 2016 and stopped. Um, but now I think this is the year to do it. So, um, you know, we are definitely going to get started with that. Also, I want to let you guys know that I will be in the DMV area by the end of this month. I will be in the DMV area by the end of this month. All right. We're going to set up our KHM chapter in the DMV area. I will be in D.C. and Baltimore by the end of this month. All right. We're aiming for uh, the last weekend of this month, which should be the 25th, 26th and 27th. Um, I should be uh, willing. If all goes well, I should be out in the DMV area so we can set up another KHM chapter. So for those of y'all that are out there in the DMV area, uh, definitely let me know. You can email us kingdomharbinger at gmail.com if you want to be a part of this event. Um, and also, if you want to help out, if you want to volunteer and assist as well, we can use that as well. And also, we're looking for administrators, okay? Offline administrators, not admins or mods for the chat, but also offline administrators to partner up with us, help us to get some things sorted out and organized so that way we can continue to bring you guys some quality stuff, all right? Whether it's virtual or whether it's boots to the ground, you know how KHM gives it up, all right? Uh, so with that said, family, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoy the show. Uh, also, family, don't forget on the Patreon. Like I said, we just released a new book. It's www.patreon.com backslash divine prospect. That's where the after party goes down 24-7, 365, okay? So those of you who are not signed up for the Patreon, you do not know what you're missing. And any source that I bring out here would eventually show up on the Patreon. So that's your best bet if you want to get a point of reference for anything that was discussed on tonight. 
All right. So um, somebody said the video slightly delayed. So family, are we are we having issues still? Let me know if we still having issues. Um, I mean, it looks okay from what I can see. Um, but let me know if everything is okay. All right. Um, Eli Yisrael says, when will you be in ATL? I'm always in ATL. That's my home base. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, if y'all want to do anything, ATL, there's an event actually next weekend that I've been invited to speak at. Uh, so I'll give the details on there as soon as I get the fly and I share it with y'all. But if y'all in ATL, come out to the event, show some support, and we can chop it up afterwards. All right. Um, all right. Everybody's saying it's good. So it might just be one person with the issue. So. All right. So I'm not going to be able to give all my shout outs now because there's a lot of y'all in the building. Um, and I want to help you get started because I don't want to hold up um, the brother Eliyahu um, or Yemyahu Eliyahu's time. I want to make sure that I'm respectable for his time and um, that he is uh, awake and he is involved so he doesn't doze off in the background. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but let me give you guys a little background on how this started. Um, and then from there, I'm going to let him introduce himself and then we're going to have a discussion. All right. Um, somebody says you're you are slightly cloudy. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Are you talking about the image is cloudy? My voice is cloudy. Not sure what that means. Um, let me know what you mean by by cloudy. All right. Um, but anyway, let me give you guys a background real quick on what this is about. Um, and then I'm gonna step away for one second and grab some water and I'll be right back and I'm gonna let uh, Yem Yahu, um, open up with his, uh, you know, introduction. So this is how this started. Okay. So I've had, um, reached out, um, and had other, uh, rabbis, uh, from rabbinic Judaism reach out to me in the past and, um, been striving for a long time to kind of like arrange a discussion. Um, I've had several discussions off camera, like at synagogues and so forth, um, or, you know, places of worship in Knesset, um, and online. Um, but then when it came time to, um, set things up, uh, it became extremely difficult. You know what I'm saying? Um, somebody says they can't see anything. Um, uh, I was just, I'm just going to keep it on this screen so I can make sure that, I mean, it looks good from my end, so I'm not sure what's going on with you guys. I'm not sure. Um, hopefully, Hopefully everything is okay. I can't really monitor that too much, but um, yes, this is this show is live. This show is live. All right, so let me keep going. All right, so um, I've been striving for a while. We're talking about a couple of years now, um, trying to get um, some rabbis or anybody that's willing to um, defend rabbinic Judaism or Second Temple Judaism in a dialogue, um, in a dialogue where there's some diametrically opposed worldviews. Um, and vantage points in regards to Torah, the application of Torah, the identity of Israelites today, who's a Jew, et cetera. Um, and um, it took some time. You know, um, I've had, I have two more rabbis that are still interested, but, you know, schedules are really crazy. My schedule is crazy. Their schedule is crazy. So I'm not sure, you know, if that's going to uh, manifest in the future. Maybe Yim Yahoo can make a suggestion. We'll see. Um, but um, Young Pharaoh had a debate uh, discussion with a rabbi that goes, you know, on IG by the name of at millennial rabbi, uh, very cool down to earth person. You know what I'm saying? When I interface with him, um, people was hitting me up and was like, yeah, you know, young Pharaoh's is talking to this rabbi, you divine, you got to watch it. So they start sending me the links of it. And I started watching and I said, wow, this is a pretty interesting discussion. Um, I, you know, I see where young Pharaoh was going, but I'm like, I would definitely take a more structured approach, you know, more level headed approach. Uh, more fact-based approach in regards to a discussion. Um, so uh, people was like, man, you know, reach out to the rabbi, talk to the rabbi. So y'all asked me to do this. Okay. So I reached out to him. Um, and again, he responded, you know, promptly. Uh, we had a, a discord dialogue. He told me that he would have no problem having a discussion with me. He said, but at the moment he's kind of exhausted from his bill with young Farrell. So he wanted to take a step away from that um, and focus on other priorities. But he said that he will recommend somebody to me. And I said, okay. So, you know, I waited about a day or so. And, um, you know, he reached back out to me and said, Hey, you know, I got this good brother. His name is, um, you know, Yim Yahu Eliyahu, uh, young brother, you know, he's part of the IDF. Those of you who don't know what that is as Israel defense forces. Uh, that's the military uh, that protects Israel. 
Um, and he's like, man, this brother's really astute. He's a good person to build with. You know, he's young, he's he's vibrant, got a lot of vigor. So that'll be somebody I think that would make for a very thought provoking discussion. And I was like, all right, cool. That sounds good. So, you know, uh, I reached out to him and our brother has then done his best to stay in touch. You know, just so you'll know, he's in Israel, right? He's physically in Israel right now. Um, so there is a seven hour time difference between me and him. So that's why um, I'm going late tonight. Uh, Cause if I went any earlier, he probably would, he probably was sleeping or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we're trying to um, schedule something for this upcoming Friday, which I explained to you all last week. Um, but that cuts into the brother's Sabbath. So um, it wasn't going to be good to do it um, at that time. So I respected that. So we went back and forth. And then eventually he said, look, I'm only available to be honest with you for right now for on Tuesday night, you know, and I'm like, uh, it's kind of cutting it because, you know, I have to move some things out the way for the discussion. But um, whatever the case would be, I was like, all right, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. It's not going to be as formal as I structured um, as I would like to. I'm not going to be as prepared as I would like to be. But, um, you know, this is something that's second nature to me, having these type of discussions um, with people in other communities. So, I mean, it's it's no biggie. You know what I'm saying? So the brother here, he got a pen and paper. So I know he's already ready to dialogue. Um, so I definitely appreciate you all for coming on the show and uh, watching this great exchange that's going to happen. As you can see, the flyers up there. I think it was a dope flyer. My flyer man. Shout out to my flyer man. I'm sure he's in the building. Um, yes, he is in the building. I saw his, his comment earlier. So I want to appreciate him for putting together this dope flyer and um, really promoting this discussion at the last minute. Because all the promotion was done same day. All right. So without further ado, uh, just give me one minute. I'm going to step away for a second. I'm going to get settled, get something to drink. And I'll be right with you. And then as soon as I come back on the screen, I will uh, allow the brother to introduce himself. All right. So just give me one second. I'm going to be right back with y'all. Okay. Okay. So I'm back family. I'm back. All right. Thank you guys for waiting patiently. So we about to get started again. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you guys hit the thumbs up button family. All right. Hit that thumbs up button. Hit subscribe. If you're brand new to this channel and go back and check out our archives, binge watching them as soon as this show is over and please share this video. Let's get as many people in our community in the building. All right. So we can have a thoroughly enjoyable discussion. All right. And if time permits, um, I will open it up to Q&A at the end. Um, it's not going to be an extensive Q&A. It's going to be a very short 15, 30 minute Q&A. So whoever can jump on, can jump on. You'll have an opportunity, make a comment, um, ask a question, and then we'll be moving on. All right. I don't want this to be too extended on this evening. Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and uh, bring the brother on. All right. Drop the flyer. All right. And I'm bringing him on right now. So so y'all know this is Yim Yahu Danzig, um, a.k.a. Eliyahu. I'm going to let the brother uh, get a few minutes so he can introduce himself to the people. Uh, let us know who you are, what your background is, what your interest <laughs> is, uh, maybe your age and something else like that. But whatever you want to share as your intro, uh, you have the floor. So first of all, Ron, I want to... Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, there's a bit of a lag, so a little bit of the end cut out, but uh, from what I understood, just introduce myself, uh, generally speaking, and then we can uh, build from there. Um, so you alluded to in your introduction, the unfortunate fact that these conversations barely happen, right? And I think that part of the reason that they don't happen is that unfortunately, most of the, certainly the American Jewish community are unaware of the existence 
of the uh, of the ever growing and basically forever existent uh, African Hebrew community in the United States. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. And maybe we'll get into some of those reasons later today. But uh, I basically never had that uh, privilege, if we can define it as something like that, or that uh, reality. Um, I'm a first generation American. My, uh, my mother came from Guyana, from the Caribbean, where, to the United States. Um, during the period of the 1960s, when a lot of uh, Caribbeans were leaving the West Indies to come to the United States, to New York City specifically. Um, and my father uh, came from Israel. Um, before they, uh, they had come from Israel, my family was five generations in Jerusalem. And um, during the period of the uh, Hebrew rebellion against the British rule in the, uh, in the 1930s, uh, my grandfather was uh, forced to flee from, uh, from the British Mandate of Palestine um, after uh, killing a number of British um, soldiers and officers as a part of the Hebrew rebellion. Um, so my uh, family background made it so that I would, had to be not only ever conscious and, uh, and uh, thinking about the relations between uh, African peoples, uh, African diaspora and the Hebrew diaspora, um, was basically a ever present part of my life. Um, I uh, grew up in the United States. Um, I was constantly dealing with the fact that I have to confront multiple identities within the American, European, uh, Western civilization landscape, um, both as a, a person of color, uh, descendant of slaves in the in the Caribbean, and as a Jew. Um, and that led me to a lot of different things, but most, most uh, specifically and relevant to our discussion today, it led me to very in-depth study uh, and an embrace of uh, Hebrew identity um, and what it means to be a Hebrew in the West, in this Eurocentric American civilization. Um, one thing led to another, and I decided that I, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was 19 years old, I was going to move to Israel. Uh, after moving to Israel, I then uh, studied... Uh, at an Israeli university, I got my bachelor's degree in uh, homeland security, counterterrorism, uh, Middle Eastern uh, studies, uh, and public diplomacy. Um, during that time period, I also studied in a yeshiva. A yeshiva is uh, an institute of Torah learning in uh, Jerusalem. The yeshiva is known as uh, Machon Meir for anybody that's uh, that is familiar with the yeshiva scene in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, during that time period, I just I dove very deeply into not only uh, the politics and society of uh, Israel, but also um, the languages that are spoken in the land, which includes obviously Hebrew, includes uh, Arabic, um, and the study of our ancient texts and our history. Um, in Israel, for people that are not familiar with Israeli society, it's a very diverse society. We've been fortunate, we've been blessed in, our, in my generation and generations leading up to this generation to witness a mass return of, uh, of Israelites from all over the world, including from the African diaspora. Um, and we can, we'll get into kind of my experience with that, perhaps uh, more in this uh, discussion. But um, one thing I definitely want to, uh, want to mention um, is the fact that um, as Hebrews in this generation, I think we have a, an incredible responsibility uh, to have these conversations, right? To understand our personal roles throughout history and our role in this very specific moment, um, particularly in the United States, when uh, discussion of race and identity and uh, oppression and persecution and st structures of uh, persecution continue to be a dominant aspect of the of the conversation. We need to understand what we can do. Uh, and what uh, and what we can uh, do in order to have these types of conversations going forward. Um, and um, without further ado, I'll I'll give you the uh, the mic and uh, let's start this conversation. All right, cool, cool, sounds good. So before we get started, if you don't mind, can you share how old you are to the audience? Absolutely. I'm uh, so I'm 25 years old. And I kind of missed off on the last part of my uh, bio. After studying in the uh, university in Israel and after studying in yeshiva. I uh, joined the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. Um, I was a, uh, I am a squad commander in the, uh, in a basically uh, part of the Israeli uh, Defense Force that focuses on counterterrorism. 
and uh, I've been in the command role for uh, for a few years now, and uh, I'm 25 years old. Wow. Okay, that's that's really good, man. You've accomplished a lot at 25. <laughs> so I got to give I'm, you a prop. I'm for trying that. to. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, That's good. That. So, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, your background is really interesting because, I mean, we didn't really uh, intro, introduce each other, uh, ourselves to each other before this dialogue. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, I didn't I really didn't know what to expect, but I was welcome to whatever was brought to the table. He actually picked somebody really good. You know, what I'm saying young and astute to have this discussion with. So. I really look forward to having a discussion with you, man. And I wasn't even sure of your, your background heritage, but that's that's good to know, man. That's really interesting, really interesting, okay? So um, let me let me ask you something that's been, you know, that's been, I mean, at least for here in America, I'm not sure how rampant it is there in Israel at the moment, but this, this topic of anti-Semitism, right? Um, anti-Semitism, um, as it's defined, is any kind of defamation, attack, or offensive, derogatory remarks that are made towards uh, the Jews, right? And the Jews, um, you know, as a culture, as a community, as a people, right? Uh, based on what has historically has happened to them and um, the results of where they're at today. Um, so when you hear this term anti-Semitism, can you please let me know what comes to mind when you hear this term and what is your perception of it and what do you think should be done about it? Absolutely. So first I'd like to start off by saying that um, I have a passion for etymology and linguistics, right? As I alluded to in, uh, in my introduction. So when I first thing when I hear any term is I think about what the origins of that, of that term are, any term, regardless of the term. So specifically when we're talking about anti-Semitism, I think about the person who coined that term originally and the context in which it was coined, right? And for people that are unfamiliar, the term anti-Semitism to describe the hatred or the, uh, or the prejudice against uh, Jewish people only began in the 18 uh, in the 1800s, and it was coined by a person named Wilhelm Marr in Germany. So, why did Wilhelm Marr decide to specifically change the term, which before it was it might have been referred to as anti-Judaism, anti-Jewishness, um, but then he decided specifically to call it uh, anti-Semitism. And the reason was is that anti-Semitism has to be understood within the context of white supremacy. Any discussion that, discuss, that talks about anti-Semitism without dealing with the history and the ideological underpinnings of white supremacy is simply, the, is simply an uninformed discussion of the topic. And so basically we have to understand is that what Wilhelm Marr was saying in his famous uh, text where he called Germanism versus Judaism, right? Is he was saying that the German people, because he was a German, are at a, a are in an internal conflict with the Semites of Europe, right? With the Semites that are in Germany, because they come from not a uh, a foreign, simply a foreign culture and a foreign religion, right? Which is what the Catholic Church had focused on before that. That was the anti-Judaism, the anti-Torah uh, uh, Jew hatred that came before it. But specifically, they have a foreign and alien culture and religion because they come from the Semitic race, because they come from an inferior race and a race that's inferior to the German, European, and then later as the Nazis developed this ideology further as, into the Aryan race, right? So when we talk about anti-Semitism, we have to understand that it specifically took all of the uh, prejudices, all of the stigmas and stereotypes that had built up against Hebrews not, not just in the world, but specifically Hebrews that were a minority in Western civilization, in Europe, and took it and morphed it into a racial ideology, morphed it into something that was specifically uh, a part of white supremacy, right? The issue, right, whenever we talk about that is that we assume the white supremacy is just this kind of, oh, white, the white, the so-called white race is superior, and anybody who is not within that specific racial designation is inferior. Yes, that's true, but it's way more complex than that. The stereotypes and the kind of racial prejudice that accompanies each uh, non-white group within that ideology changed over time periods and they took on a different form. So when we talk about anti-Semitism today, right, which is a direct uh, descendant of the anti-Semitism of the 18th 
uh, or even 17th, 18th, and 19th, and 20th century European anti-Semitism, we have to understand that it inherited uh, a whole legacy of thousands of years of stereotypes against people in general, even going back to the Greek and Roman in medieval Europe, where um, where basically you, Jews were specifically described as a race that was inherently conniving, inherently conspiratorial, and controlling. These were things that were said to have been in their blood, right? And we can we, we can we, like uh, we can have this conversation more in terms of where it comes from. It actually comes from the Spanish Inquisition. It was the first time that that notion was iterated, but it came into full expression in Germany and France uh, in the 1800s, and then came to its basically its crescendo. Um, with the Nazi Holocaust, which was something which is a, a huge topic, which we can discuss more. All right. Great, great, great. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, because, you know, over here on this side of the pond, uh, we have uh, several celebrities in the black community uh, that have recently come out, you know, um, in regards to um, certain disdain or even certain misconceptions or perceptions in regards to the Jewish community. Um, and they feel marginalized by that community for that community is contributing uh, to the, uh, I would say the appendant of uh, white supremacy and oppressing and suppressing the community. Um, and they believe that they are controlling various medias of media um, and society where they feel like they're keeping this red tape and preventing our community from getting a step up. Um, and, you know, you had celebrities such as, you know, um, Deshaun Jackson come out, Nick Cannon come out. I um, uh, forgot the guy that's in uh, UK uh, as well. And they're coming out. Uh, Ice Cube, you know, has been using certain things as well and reusing or modifying certain memes um, in order to project, you know, what it is that they feel or their perception of in regards to the Jewish community. Um, now, my on my perspective of it is that there are some things on the table that has to be done factually, right? A lot of times what people do is that they reach for conspiracy theories, right? Without knowing the provenance or origin of certain of those conspiracy theories and use that as a blanket statement against the other community. Uh, what I simply wanna do is just look at the facts, right? Deal with references, sources, um, and be able to go from there. So that way, once something is placed on the table, we can discuss it, we can kind of give perspectives on it and kind of have a build or discussion, you know what I'm saying? And then wherever we are diametrically opposed as far as the community, then we can have constructive academic style debates um, in order to hash certain things out. So that way we can come to a common understanding whether we agree or disagree, right? But at least it's on the table and it's beneficial for the communities to see so that way we can grow and make some progress. Um, so what I wanted to do is just ask some questions with somebody that does have uh, a lineage um, to the Jewish community in Israel. And um, you fit the bill because you said that your grandfather and I think your great grandfather and your father's lineage um, is from Israel. Um, and you said on your mother's side is from Guyana, right, in the Caribbean. Uh, well, Guyana is part of South America, but most of us think it's part of the Caribbean. <laughs> um, uh, but. Um, but it's good to know that because this way um, you are sentimentally invested um, and given a perspective as it pertains to your mixed heritage as well, right? Um, so with that being said, I think the the uh, one of the things that I would like to ask you since we put on the table, and we could probably give our, our perspectives on it. Um, and feel free, if you want to make any references to anything, you want to share your screen, anything like that, just let me know and you'll have the opportunity to do so as well, okay? All right. So, Sounds uh, good. First, um, thing, first of all, I want, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, just, I, I'm obviously going to give this up in a second. I'm not going to speak for a lot. I just want to mention a few things with related to with what you just said right now. First of all, I agree with basically everything you said. There's kind of nothing that you can dispute there. That is the reality right now in terms of the lived experience of people and the perceptions, right, across the board, right? Like you said, on both sides of the pond. Um, of course, this isn't something which is a major topic of discussion in Israel. I'm aware of it because I have family, I have friends in the United States, and that's the reason why I know. In Israel, we have a plethora of different challenges and issues, um, for better and for worse. I'm not saying this is entire. This is a good thing. This is a positive thing. So, so it's not part of the the discourse here, um, and maybe we can get into the why that is later. Um, but it's certainly a major issue within the community in in the United States, and that's the reason why I'm aware of it. I would like to mention one thing, which is kind of a directly leads from what you were just saying, is that when we understand the, the, the conspiracy, right? 
that you have to understand that when we're talking about the racial stereotyping of Hebrews in Europe under this anti-Semitic doctrine is it was inherently tied to conspiracy, right? So whereas they would like, there was convenient, right? And it was natural for the Europeans to, to try and describe all of the peoples that they were meeting in the age of exploration in Asia, in Africa, in the new world as this kind of savages, right? And each one has like a specific stereotype, right? The stereotype for the Native American wasn't the same as it was for the, for the African and so on and so forth. But for the, the Hebrew, right, because of his proximity to the European in the continent, right, what they would do is they would always situate the Hebrews as this kind of um, this intermediary class, this intermediary race, this intermediary ethnic group. So they would be able to use the stereotypes against Hebrews as being controlling, conniving, so on and so forth. And we can talk about why that became those became the stereotypes for Hebrews as a way to then direct all of the hatred from the lower from the lower caste towards the intermediary group instead of towards the elites, right? And you can see like where's like the perfect example of this, right? When we talk about the Igbo in uh, Nigeria, right? The Igbo in Nigeria for people that aren't familiar with this community, right? We're talking about a community that has been in the area of the Bight of Biafra on, on the Niger River for thousands of years, right? Certainly, right, with, uh, with ancestry and heritage that traces the, their community to the northern kingdoms, uh, to the northern kingdom of Israel, right? But in the anti Semitism that they experience, their very real lived experience of anti Semitism is one where, the, and it goes back further, further than this, but we're just talking about modern history is where the British came in, right? Very long, complex history, very, very short. British came in and they said, you, right? are the intermediary race, the intermediary class, right? And the rest of these African ethnic groups are the lower caste. Those were the Aruba, those were the House of the Fulani, the Bibio, so on and so forth. And you are different, right? But not different in a way that, oh, you're like us. You're different in the way that you're more like us, right? But you're still not good enough, right? You're, it's, and we can talk about why that is, the concept of mongrel ancestry, so on and so forth. But the, the, the anti-Semitic canards, the libel that has led to the death of millions of Igbo and the continued assault on Igbo to this day is the same exact uh, stereotypes, the same exact uh, lies that lead to, con uh, to describing Igbo as conniving, clannish, conspiratorial, and controlling, right? So that's just something I want to mention, and, we, and then I'll give it back to you, and then we can build from there. Okay, wow. Um... I, I'm, <laughs> I don't know what to say because apparently there's a lot of stuff that you're saying that um, I'm in agreement with. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just didn't think that I was going to have this type of discussion, but that's good. <laughs> I'll just adapt to it. You know what I'm saying? Um, all right. That's cool. Um, so with that being said, and it's great that you say that because I have some Igbo ancestry on my father's side. Um, I want to ask you a question. So when it comes to uh, the claim that certain African-Americans make in regards to having Israelite ancestry. What is your perspective on that? Sure, so basically I think that it's important for people to understand, right? And, and I don't mean people in the sense that just Jewish Americans, I think it's important also for African Americans in general and specifically for African Hebrews, right? Whether they're in the United States or, in, uh, or still on the continent of Africa to understand that African, American Jews, Jewish Africans, Caribbean Jews has something that's been a reality, right? Regardless of the history, and we'll talk about the history in a second in terms of the ancestral history. But this is something that's been a reality since the beginning of the African diaspora. This isn't something that just popped up, right? It's academics tend to have, make this mistake when they examine this phenomenon, this religious spiritual phenomenon that's happening in the United States as something that just started in the 1960s. It's not the case, right? This is something that um, was clearly seen in the 1800s. It was seen uh, certainly in the 1930s, right? From the, from the first interactions of uh, American Jews and African-Americans in the urban centers, particularly in New York City. Um, and it's something that we can't simply just write off as being some type of, oh, um, there's some allusion to, to Israelites uh, as being slaves and we were also slaves, so therefore, you know, let's let's become Hebrews. It's not. It, it, it's it's way too elementary of an explanation, 
right? So, but so what we do do, right, is we look at the history, right? We check the we check the facts, we check the we check archaeology, we check anthropology, and what we find, right, is that certainly there was a history of a Hebrew and a Jewish presence. We can talk about the differentiation of the terms, right? But there was certainly a Hebrew and a Jewish presence in West Africa, right? This is not something that's disputed. The problem is, is that it's not something that's well known, right? It's not that it's well known because of some conspiracy for it to be well known. It's 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 not known because number one, people in general, I don't know if anybody has realized this, are very uninformed. Doesn't matter if they're if they're uneducated just about other uh, uh, other people, they're uneducated about their own traditions and cultures, right? This is not something which which is specific to any one community. It's something which is across the board. Education is the most important thing for us to focus on right now. And that's because human beings have a tendency to be ignorant, right? Because we're not exposed to a lot of things that, that are outside of our own circle, right? Now, when we start looking at that historical record, right, we see that certainly there is a, a, a Hebrew tradition going back from, from, certain, from at least the first century uh, AD that some of the 10 lost tribes, some we call them lost, right? They weren't really lost if we really think about what that term means, right? Went, toward, went to Africa. Where in Africa? Africa is a gigantic place. It's not a country, it's a continent full of societies and civilizations, not one civilization, civilizations, plural, right? And when we look specifically, right, at the different regions where uh, Judeans and the descendants of Judea, whether they were in North Africa or in the Mediterranean or in Europe, right? We're thinking that in within that continent, deep in that continent, uh, and certainly in West Africa, there has to be a Hebrew civilization. There has to be a tribe, at least, of Hebrews. And when I look at the historical record, I look at the anthropo anthropological information that I have today, and I'm certainly not uh, one to say that my approach, my perspective is the one that decides, right? From my research alongside experts within uh, these West African societies, right? I have certainly come to the conclusion, I think that many people can see it if they look at this in, a, in an unbiased fashion, that with the, within the Igbo society uh, in what is today Nigeria, what was formerly Biafra, what was before that, this, this kind of cultural community along the Niger River, right, is a Hebrew community, right? And certainly if that uh, population, which we know they were, was disproportionately enslaved in the New World, then there's no doubt that there are African Americans and Caribbean people today, right, that are descendants of those communities. And this manifested itself in many different ways, right? The thing that makes it complicated, right, and this is something that I was only, it was brought to my attention by scholars within the Igbo community, is that the transatlantic slave trade was something that the targeted and engulfed a plethora of communities, tribes, even kingdoms, right? Because we forget that there were, we're not talking about just purely tribal societies, we're talking about advanced political systems that existed during that time period. And many of those uh, tribes and nations were at war with each other, right? Many of those nations to this very day uh, victimize and attack relentlessly the Igbo in Nigeria. So we have to understand that it's a complex situation. This isn't something that is cut and dry. What that does not absolve us of, oh, okay, roll, roll mixed, roll this, roll that. So that means there's nothing to be said here. No, definitely not the case, right? The human story is one of complexity. The human story is one of, of cultural interaction and diffusion, right? So certainly what we cannot do is say, okay, the Hebrew uh, identity and civilization is something which we can just be like, okay, that's there, but this is there and it's all equal. No, right? Hebrew identity is something special. It's something to be cherished and it's something that we can build on and learn from collectively, right? So I certainly think that the, the idea that there are African-Americans and Caribbean people, right? And my family is an example of this, right? So that are holding on and grabbing on to their, to their cultural heritage that takes them back to, to the Igbo, that takes them back to ancient Israel, right? Is something that should be not only uh, appreciated, but should be encouraged. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you for sharing that again. Um, <laughs> I, I like your approach because it's not um, standoffish. It's not 
black and white. You know, you actually do explore the gray area when it comes to certain things like this, subject matters of this. And um, you're given a very holistic uh, approach to uh, understanding, you know, the complexity in regards to uh, this transatlantic slave trade as far as migrations into uh, Western Central Africa, et cetera. So that's that's excellent. I'm glad you were able to answer that. I guess as we continue to go forward and, um, you know, give you an opportunity to bring some things up that you maybe want to discuss. So I may want to discuss. Um, I just like I just like this discussion. I just was not prepared. I thought you was going to be diametrically opposed to everything. But I see that you have a good head on your shoulders. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you, thank you. You picked the first to have a dialogue with me. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. All right. So with that being said, um, let's discuss um, what your understanding is of uh, how do you historically authenticate jewelry, right? So we was looking for uh, Israelites. Um, let's say people call them the the lost tribes, right? The ten tribes or Judeans. You know what I'm saying? Or Yahudim uh, that scattered abroad, right? How do you historically authenticate? any kind of ancestry claims, right? Whether it be in Africa, whether it be in Asia and Europe, uh, what is what do you, what is your approach to that? You know what I'm saying? So if somebody comes to you and say, hey, I'm a Jew, you know what I'm saying? Because um, I'm from here, how would you authenticate that? Right, okay. So I think it's a wonderful question. Um, first of all, I would like to, to preface that I do come from like an academic background, right? I have a, I have a university degree and my intention is to continue getting these degrees. Um, so because of that, I certainly have a deep appreciation and value for primary sources, right? Whether those be in documents or whether that be in archaeology. Um, that being said, I believe that there is a, uh, a wrong bias, right? Or a wrong-headed bias and that has developed within Western civilization to focus on primary sources to the detriment of all other types of information, right? And then when, particularly when we look at um, not just Semitic civilizations, but Afro-Asiatic civilizations in general, right? African and Asiatic civilizations, we see a very clear value which is put on oral tradition, right? Which is put on the ability of communities and the trust that we put in communities to be able to, uh, to some level accurately um maintain their personal and collective histories right so basically to, to put that in kind of layman's terms the uh my, my position is that what we should do in any type of in any situation like this we need to obviously consult first and foremost the oral tradition of the community right or what community is the person coming from what is the oral tradition what's the oral history after we've then established what the oral history is right because it's not so simple this guy this community might say that another community might say that you need to have a, a consensus of what that oral um, tradition may be. Once you have a consensus on certain key principles, then you check the primary sources, right? And you see if you have anything that could authenticate it or could out of just totally invalidate it, right? Because to that to say that there are oral histories that aren't completely made up, right, would be would be wrong, right? There certainly are situations where and we can it's complicated how that then happens, right? But there are certainly contexts in which that is the case. Um, but what I would say is that we're talking specifically about this issue, this issue, the issue of Hebrew ancestry, of, answer, of, of being a Jew, right? What that means, first thing is what we do is we check out what the, what the history is. I mean, I, I'll give you a specific example, a very, a very uh, a historical example. There was, uh, and we're going way back. So we're going, we're going to go back to the, uh, the turn of the century. And we have a, a rabbi living in Egypt, right? He was known as the, the Radbaz. And he was living there as a part of the, uh, the community of Jewish exiles that had been there since even before the Roman exile, right? I'm sure, if, I'm sure you're familiar, the existence of a, uh, a community of Judean exiles, of a Judean diaspora in Egypt is something which, which basically is dated to the, before the Ptolemaic period. Right of the of the Greek conquest of of the Middle East and North Africa, um, so he was living there during that time period as and he was the rabbi of the community there, and then all of a sudden somebody some individuals came, right from the south, and those individuals identified themselves to him as being from uh, the uh, Israelite community in Kush. So what he did, right, his first thing is he started asking colleagues, right. Do we have a, do we have traditions? Does anybody know of there being a uh, an Israelite community in Kush? 
And so then he started hearing that, yes, there was somebody named Eldad Hadani who had come from that region. People, people that his text was circulated within the community. People had knew that there were rumors, right? And at this point, every most people had believed it to be a true fact that there was certainly a large uh, Israelite community in Kush. And specifically, when we're talking about Kush, right, for them, that encapsulated from all the whole the region from Sudan, because Kush originally was Sudan, it wasn't Ethiopia, right? But it, it went from Sudan all the way to what is today's Ethiopia. And so after he validated that, right, he validated that there is an oral tradition, right, that we know from an oral history, from word to mouth, that there is probably a community there, he then consults the history text, right? And then and then we get to the, the primary sources you can look at all the different records in the region oh this is describing that there were that there were israelites living here and then that's how basically we can authenticate good i like that because that's the exact same approach that i take in regards to authenticating things Ron, as I think, well uh, we're breaking and up um I'm... can you can you hear me hello Ron, you're breaking up. Uh, I think I'm um, the, the chat chat hit hit one or hit two. Hit one if I'm breaking up. Hit two if it might be Yim Yahoo. Um, he's saying that I'm breaking up on his end. Uh, let's get a quality check, family. There's almost 500 of us in here. Hit one if I'm breaking up. Hit two if he's breaking up. Or hit three if everything is okay. Let me know. Um, and make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button. Um, hit that thumbs up button. Um, Oh, you guys are saying that he's breaking up? Okay. Uh, he said, I'm breaking up a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not sure, but you know what? Um, Yim Yahoo, let us, what we can do for now is uh, cut your mic off and keep your, uh, cut your camera off and keep your mic on. Um, that may help with the bandwidth so that there's, there's less lag. Sure. Just what was, right, so uh, what was heard from what I said? It might be worth uh, reiterating. No, I, I heard I heard everything you said, um, but I didn't get to start okay, talking great. yet. And you said that, well, yeah. So you could just you just click the um, where it says uh, start cam or the cam. Just click on stop cam, and let me know if if it's better. Leave the mic on. Just hit stop cam. Yeah. Trying to see. Ah, okay. Just click on the cam. Hey. Yep, right. there you go. All right, this is better? All right, great. I hear you fine. You hear me fine? Okay, great, great. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um and uh respond. People are saying everything is good. They heard it. So, all right, we can't see you. All right, that's good. All right, so um I think we'll just um do it like this for a second and then um you know. It'll be okay. They've seen our faces already, so they'll be okay. All right. Um, all right. So that's great that you said that in regards to, um, you know, authenticating the claim. Um, like you said, go through the oral tradition, which I agree with. Uh, look for any primary sources, uh, any secondary sources in regards to those primary references from people who are experts in the field um, that can assist uh, with the testimony to, um, you know, authenticate those claims as well. Uh, try to look at migration routes. Uh, any archaeology, like you had mentioned as well. Um, so pretty much perusing through the social sciences and the realm of anthropology and looking to see what can be reconstructed uh, as a behavioral profile, right? Um, and then we can use that as a behavioral profile in order to authenticate whether or not a claim can be substantiated or whether it's just a mere assertion, right? So I definitely do appreciate your academic approach um, because it's very refreshing to find somebody um, on the opposite end that takes that type of holistic approach. And it may just be this generation, you know, um, that is being a little bit more uh, ahead of the curve, right, than the previous generation in regards to understanding things holistically, right? So uh, I pretty, I really do appreciate the fact that you gave that type of answer as opposed to one that is uh, religiously and dogmatically laden uh, to the point where it's a heavy burden and it's so heavy that when you push it, uh, you're actually creating the distance between you and the person you're talking to as well as, you know, as opposed to creating a bridge, right? And having a dialogue, right? Where you can appreciate uh, whatever the other angle is. So um, I definitely want to um, um, give you some kudos on that. Uh, it's interesting because a lot of things you touched on is little things that I have already on the table that I want to bring out for us to discuss, but you have brought some of it up. So some things I guess we can just wing it and um, just, uh, you know, pretty much freestyle on it. And I'll, I'll 
back up some of the things you just said and give my perspective on it as well. Before I do it, I want to ask you one more question, and then I'll probably build after that. Is uh, from your studies and then from your um, your particular walk and experience, or the experience of others that are your colleagues, family, etc. Um, what is like? How was somebody classified as a Jew, quote unquote? Okay, sure. So um, basically, um, when we're talking about the way the Jewish community views anything, first of all, it's important to understand that the Jewish community is certainly not a monolith, right? The uh, whether we're talking about the Jewish community in the United States and, and even more so in uh, the land of Israel, we're talking about uh, a number of communities that as a result of more contemporary circumstances have kind of been uh, united, have been pushed together, um, have united themselves and have by historical circumstances been brought together. So a lot of these things that, uh, you know, might be held uh, traditionally as Jews um, in just in recent generations as a result of increased pressure from European society to assimilate as a result of anti-Semitism, as a result of a lot of different cultural influences that everybody, not just Hebrews are confronted with, but every ethnic group is confronted with in, in the West, um, have started to assimilate their ideas and uh, basically abandon some of the things that were traditionally considered to be um, the building blocks of Hebrew life for thousands of years in exile. Um, but when we're talking about uh, what that traditional viewpoint is, it's based inherently with what uh, we called halakha. And I know you referred to that in, uh, in your original intro. Um, and basically, just for people that are not familiar, and we can talk about this more, halakha is basically, it's for people that are familiar with Islam, the, the term for Islamic law is sharia. Right? Sharia mm -hmm. basically means that it is uh, like a pathway, right? And, the, and, it, and that term comes specifically from the Hebrew term, the Hebrew predecessor of halakha which basically mm -hmm. comes from the people that know Hebrew. Holech, right? Halicha, it's like you're walking, you're on a place in which you're in, it's a way that guides you, right? So right. this concept, right, um, of how to live as a Hebrew individual and as a, how to live in a Hebrew community is something which is very ancient, right? And that is not to say that this system isn't something that has changed over time, right? And basically the the central uh, Judean argument, right? And this is something which dates to the first century. Um, and I shouldn't say that. So basically before the first century, during the Maccabean period, um, is that, you know, the Hebrew law is something that has to have a means to adapt with the challenges of each generation. Um, and part of those challenges, right? Um, you know, it was uh, basically how do you identify Hebrews in the context of uh, being in surrounded by non-Hebrew peoples and societies. So whereas in uh, before the Babylonian exile, you had a re Israelite reality, which were basically, we had uh, other nations that were around us, right? Within the day-to-day -day life of Hebrews, we were surrounded mostly by Hebrews, right? So the issue of who is a Hebrew was less of an issue, right? Uh, not to say that the Torah didn't specifically have guidelines, right, or at least framework to understand who was an Israelite, um, but those ideas weren't focused, so th that idea specifically wasn't focused on just because of lack of necessity. Um, with the Babylonian exile, right, because the difference between the Assyrian exile and the Babylonian exile, that after the Babylonian exile, 70 years after, those exiles went back to the land of Israel. And when they went back to the land of Israel, they were confronted with the Judeans who had not been exiled, right? And all of a sudden you see, you see Ezra, and you see Nehemiah um, having this conversation with this dialogue with the, with the Hebrews that never left. And, and they're telling them, look, look into the Torah, right? We can't have a situation, right? We see the, that there is a, a, a Torah precedence that is going against intermarriage as a part of their uh, court decisions, right? Because we have this this great court, the Anshe Knesset Agadol in Hebrew, um, that was making decisions, right? Based to basically how to apply Hebrew law in that generation, and they had made the decision that uh, that Hebrew identity, Hebrew national identity, as opposed to tribal identity, and there's a there's a they we differentiate there, um, goes by the mother. Right. And from that period until today, right, when we're talking about ancestral Hebrew lineage, uh, Hebrew com Jewish communities have gone by the mother for the nation 
and the father for the tribe. Um, and that's basically uh, maintained itself until this day. And obviously the big caveat to that is that from that time period, there also became, for this, and we're talking about the same time period after the return of the Judeans from exile to Judea, uh, you also have the system basically making the process of naturalization, what is incorrectly translated from Hebrew into English as conversion, right? Because we don't really have a concept of conversion because Judaism in our traditional perspective is not a religion, right? We can get more into that in a, in a bit. But um, basically what happened was is they then systematized the process in which a Gentile then becomes a Hebrew, right? And so those are two, the, those two basically systematic, systematized processes of identification is basically what is maintained by the majority of Jews today. Okay, cool, cool. So if we're looking at it through the lens of halakha, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the rulings uh, is matrilineal uh, for a nation, like you had presented, uh, what would that leave somebody in, in your case scenario, right? Who has a mother who's Caribbean um, and father who uh, is an Israeli? Right. Okay. So, so first, basically, the there's a number of issues here. Number one, right, is the, the first. I have to emphasize the concept, right, and the and the reason why the the book of Ruth is included in the uh, in the what became the the canon of the Hebrew Bible, right, the, the Tanakh, is very is is a very clear purpose, right. And if we look at that in historical context, right, whenever we look at all of these different stories, right? Of course, there is always contemporary meaning that we're supposed to derive from it. But it's also extremely important for us to understand these texts within their historical context, right? So if we can see, like, why is it that the Anshe Knesset Gadol, the men of the Great Assembly, decide to include the Book of Ruth within the Hebrew canon, right? We, under, we can see that clearly during that time period, we have increased interactions, right, between what were then the Canaanite, the, the basically the, the leftover populations of, the, of what was the Canaanite population and the Hebrews. And so basically they're saying that here we have this precedent of Ruth joining unto the people. We have these very poetic lines of your God is my God, your people are my people, right? Which is the, which is the key point there, right? It's saying that, you know, somebody who is born of a different nation, of a different tribe can then become a member of the tribe Right, and then marry into the tribe, which is something that was done, and we can point to, you know, examples from before the Exodus, during the Exodus, after the Exodus, all the way through Hebrew history. This is a this is a, a important theme, right? Of uh, that there were always people uh, uh, that were joining into the tribe and mixing in with the people that were descended from the uh, in, uh, the Aboriginal, the Atakanis, uh Hebrew population. Um, and for, so that's, that's the first point. The second point is that when we're talking about specifically uh, populations that uh, are, have already have Hebrew ancestry. So it might be that there was some, because of exile, because of, you know, when I say exile, because of the violence of exile, right? D forced displacement, forced rape, right? Which is an important, which is an important the, un and sad feature of Jewish and, he and history in general. Um, we have to understand that we will have many populations, not just in this generation, but in all generations uh, of, of Hebrew history that, um, that uh, basically um, uh, uh, were forced to assimilate, were forcibly disconnected from, from, uh, from the people of Israel. Um, and, and Halakha has a specific designation for those people. They're called Zera Yisrael. Right, mm -hmm. and that is called that in English. That's the seed of Israel, mm -hmm. right? And a and a lot of uh, poskim, right? Poskim are are, are are Hebrew law decisors, right? People that are like judges, right? Have have ruled that somebody who is of Hebrew descent, right? If you can establish that there's Hebrew descent on either line, uh, patrilineal or matrilineal, right? We have an obligation. Not only should or should we be encouraged, we have an obligation as members of the Hebrew nation to help them come back into the fold of, of, uh, of the nation, right? It's not like, okay, your line, uh, here we, there was somebody that, that, uh, you know, the, here was a Hebrew, a Hebrew woman that was kidnapped by a Roman, raped by a Roman. You're the product. All right. Sorry. You know, 
you're gonna have to you're you're no longer a part of it right the the strict uh the stricture in terms of not intermarrying remains the same right that never changed right there was always this very intense um uh, discouragement of uh of uh of hebrews to take foreign specifically foreign wives and there's a reason why that's emphasized right because the mother spends the most time with the children historically and today um uh, and so that was one of the reasons why that was emphasized. But in general, right, the intermarriage is something which is always discouraged, right? When somebody is marrying somebody from another who had come, had come from another nation or was descended from Hebrews that were then kidnapped, right? There's actually a concept of this, of a baby, of a, a Jewish baby who was kidnapped and raised by Gentiles. What do you do with that person, right? There's a, it's, a whole con, it's a whole discussion. It's a whole debate in Hebrew law. Um, what do you do with somebody in that situation? Because unfortunately, it was common um, in various points of uh, of Jewish history, particularly actually in even as er, even as late as uh, the 18th century, and then uh, in Russia, it was extremely common for the Russian authorities to come in and take uh, Jewish boys. Right. Um, so the concept, of what you do with that person, is that is basically you have to have a process in which that person gets reacquainted with their um, with their what was their ancestral culture. And then they're and then they're considered the the same as everybody else, right? So basically, that's that's kind of the the two major uh, approaches to the issue. Okay, cool, cool. I'm glad you said that um, because it's very peculiar when we look at the provenance of things to see how far back uh, the shoresh of something is or the root of something is in order for us to know what kind of tree we're dealing with, right? Um, so one thing that I thought was really interesting is the matrilineal principle, right? And this is something that I've spoken on before. I've done a lecture. It's called uh, How Should We Walk It Out? And in that lecture, I kind of re-examine how halakha should operate uh, in contemporary times with uh, communities that are in the diaspora, right? Uh, one of the things in looking uh, and trying to find the root of this principle is to see what primary sources that we have of its first mention, Right. Um, and if you look here on the screen, this is one one of the books that I use. I have a couple of other books as well um, that speak about what we find, you know what I'm saying, in regards to Mitrashic literature um, that actually makes this statement in regards to the matrilineal principle, right? Um, when we go and we look uh, into the works of Philo of Alexandria, we go into the works of Josephus. Um, if you go into uh, Quram scrolls uh, or anything that's first century, um, we don't really see any reference to the matrilineal principle, right? Um, it, it doesn't really show up into um, the Tainate period where things are more codified in regards to the um, the Mishnah, which is completed in 200 CE. Um, it's just, you know, it, it looks like it's an interpolation, something that's been added, uh, you know, later on in the redaction of the text as well, because it doesn't really, uh, it's not really cohesive with the uh, passage in which it's, it's found in. Um, so it's 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 reasonably a person examine it, trying to find out, okay, why is this principle there? And then once you identify the principle, what are uh, the the discussion around what we find in the the Mishnah in, in, in Talmudic literature? Um, and the main thing for me is that um, because the provenance of what we have documented as far as primary references is concerned. Uh, this matrilineal element of descendancy um, is something that is a later development that we don't really see during first century C Palestinian uh, references to this. However, we do see that in Greco-Roman culture, right? We do see the importance of the matrilineal principle amongst those cultures in regards to identity and lineage as well. Um, so I think this is something that is really interesting to look at to kind of determine um, the, the need for this particular principle uh, within the, the scope of the community in which this is coming out for um, and things that are going on. You know, a lot of um, Jews also in uh, first century see Palestine, um, you know, there was a good margin to them uh, that were trying to get Roman citizenship so they can enjoy certain benefits. Uh, matter of fact, if you do further research, polygyny was still practiced amongst first century CE Palestinians um, or Israelites. And um, the Romans, you know, upon, you know, time progressing, attempted to uh, hold uh, Roman citizenship uh, as a means of dissuading uh, polygyny amongst the uh, Judean population in the province at that time, um, which is something that, that's also interesting to, to look at and go examine. And this is because it was a form of later Hellenization, right? Even during the Roman period. Um, 
even though there was, you know, degrees of autonomy among certain communities, uh, there were still some benefits if you was in bed with the Romans, right? So there were certain things that the high Sanhedrin council or the big dean were doing in order to solidify, you know, their position so that way they're not undermined. Um, if any rival rousing was going on uh, during that period of time. And uh, what scholars say is that that's one of the reasons why this principle started to arise. Uh, it's to appeal to the elite class because of um, certain benefits that, um, you know, the, uh, I would say a subordinate class uh, was trying to obtain, right? So if you're looking at further, I have a little source on the screen uh, that talks at this in, in, in much length. Um, and a couple other books that I have um, that also speaks about this. And um, that's pretty much my position is that we need to re-examine the halakha behind that and actually see, you know, what is the environmental need uh, of this principle actually being there in order to validate uh, what was going on during that time and to use that as a defining point for identifying who's a Jew. Right. Um, so that's just one thing that I wanted to add in regards to that. And the second thing is regards to, like you said, the word halak is the root word, uh, means to walk literally, um, concretely. But then when you add the feminine suffix, ha, uh, it makes it more like an abstract principle of walking. Right. Um, and then uh, when you extract from there, it means to lead, like you said, um, lead somebody in the way that they should go. Um, and when we look at that principle, that ha, halakha principle and trying to understand, OK, well, this is how we need to operate here, because when you look over the period of time, uh, you see a situation where you did have a Sanhedrin council or being there be in Israel. And then when a persecutor started with the so-called Jewish and Roman wars, uh, things started to relocate to Babylon um, and then from Babylon over time relocate into Europe. Um, and we see uh, a lot of development in regards to these rulings from various sages and rabbis in regards to how the people are to live. Um, another interesting thing is looking at the Ming Chagim as well and trying to examine that to see the authenticity of that in regards to any halakhic rulings. Um, just so you know, my, my position is up front um, as we as we progress on. And I guess if you want to touch on, you can, um, is that I don't I don't subscribe to the um, authority of the rabbinic halakha. Right. I observe it for understanding and how they approach rulings on various things and the commentary within the Gemara. Um, but I don't see this binding for me, right? Because I believe that those in a diaspora, we need to have our own big thing and we need to also use the principle that's in Devarim chapter 16 in regards to us setting up things in regards to judges and officers in our cities and our towns in order to govern matters and rule over legal things that occur uh, within our own autonomous community. So I believe that we in a diaspora, uh, that we should bind ourselves to our own big dean so that way we can rule over the matters that are pertinent to our immediate community as opposed to certain matters that is just not applicable to us today in regards to what we see codified in the Talmud. Um, and you'll see this as a development of a thing start to happen. Even the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, man, I just forgot the reference, just skipped my mind, um, uh, where this professor was talking about how the application uh, of Veris Halakha is dependent upon, uh, you know, just making the implicit explicit based on the needs of the environment of the land, the areth, the land in which you are living in and how you have to govern and utilize Torah uh, in a captivity where there might be certain limitations to things that you can or cannot carry out. You know what I'm saying? Um, another thing is looking at in um, uh, going to Yachanan ben Zakai and looking at, um, you know, him also adapting, you know, he's, you know, student of Hillel and one of the first people, uh, you know, fathers or Rambam that was responsible for actually bringing out uh, or emerging Judaism um, and sprouting from that, you know, uh, one of the things that he had to adapt to in regard to um, the environment uh, was uh, looking at the situation where the temples destroyed and trying to find out how do you supplement the sacrifice in a post you know, destruction, temple destruction, period. You know what I'm saying? One of the things that he derived is uh, doing Mirash on Hosea chapter six, verse six, um, in regards to showing that prayers can supplement sacrifice. Well, again, they're adapting to an environmental change that's afflicting their community. So they have to use halakha in order to adapt to what is occurring, because if not, they may feel that they are out of alignment with the creator. So this is one of the developments in regards to how halakha is being used. 
if we even go back to a reference to the great assembly uh, during the time of the Maccabeans, you know, when they were being oppressed by the Greeks, they also called a, a great assembly or a council to talk about a matter that was pertinent to them at that time. Right. So is the ruling that they make based on what was going on? Should that still be binding to us today? I would say no, because it depends on the community. Right. It, it would vary. You know, and I have several associates who are Kairites as well. Um, but even they have their own halakha. They just don't acknowledge the authority of rabbinic Judaism uh, in regards to what is established in the Talmud and what's established by uh, rabbinical courts today. Uh, so I believe that it's important for us to adapt something uh, that is pertinent to our shared experience with things that we have adapted to, especially us over here as uh, African-Americans or those in the diaspora, those of us who lean on the conviction of our Israelite identity, uh, that that's what we need to be establishing for ourselves, right? Within our cities, our own communities, um, and be able to do that because you got to look at it. You know, once the dispersal of the land happened, uh, and you know, everybody has scattered, you know, Hila the second did his best in order to create the calculations for a calendar system, uh, to be utilized in the diaspora because they knew that was going to be scattered. And the same reason why we got the codification of the Mishnah and 200 CE because of the scattering that was about to occur. They saw what was about to happen in a four C, uh, what was about to happen. So they made certain adjustments to it. Uh, the same thing has to do with those who were already scattered before the situation happened. Right. They they didn't have any representatives, any any they didn't have a Zakin or an elder present in order to represent, you know, what was going on in their community at the time for something that was ruled on in Jerusalem to be binding to them. You know what I'm saying? So that's why those in a diaspora, I'm a, a proponent that they need to establish that their own halakha based on their own pertinent needs um, and using qualified elders in order to have that established because it's what's directly affecting the community, right? So I say you can look at what's been established as a template, but you also need to establish your own amongst your community and those in the African diaspora. We need to look at those who are indigenous to that land, who migrate in that region and see what they developed over time. Because uh, even if we're looking at the lost tribes theory in, in Western Central Africa, uh, this was pre-Talmudic times. Right. This is a lot of this is before the second temple was destroyed, that these people had already been scattered in these regions. Right. So what halakha did they develop? Right. What mink hagim or customs did they incorporate with that halakha in order for them to develop something that is a working framework of Torah application in the land in which they lived? You know what I'm saying? So that is also very important to look at as well. And then when we get into uh, other writings as well. We're going to see even the situation with the Sephardim when they was exiled in 1492 and they ended up in some Ashkenazim communities that there were some differences in regards to the Mink Hagim and to find out which one of those customs override Halakha or which one of them should be subservient to the Halakha of the region in which they live. So again, this is something that I believe is progressive, something that requires a think tank in the community to actually reassess and reestablish so that way it can fix the societal ills of what that immediate community is dealing with right and so that's my position on that um so what i'll do is i'll lead you you know probably go into another perspective and just ask you um aside from the academic approach that you take like i do as well when it comes to the traditional approach if you have any entanglement with that um are do you consider yourself um somebody that follows orthodox rabbinic judaism and again there's various sects within judaism um, but I'm saying in regards to rabbinical works, right? Do you do you see that as binding to you? Start off my my uh, general. First of all, you, you brought up a lot of very interesting topics, and I'll try and touch on uh, on most of them. I'm trying to remember most of them, but there's a lot of really interesting gems, historical gems, and and kind of uh, um, cultural gems. I'll try and um, uh, refer to. But first, I'll start off by saying by answering your question by saying yes. Right, I am. Uh, I am observant of uh, the halacha in the uh, in the traditional rabbinic sense, um, and I mean, I, I, I can I can tell you why. But first, I think I'm just going to talk about the general uh, the general issue that you touched on. First off, when you start, you ended uh, what you, your what your points right now by uh, by referencing that uh, basically you made the statement that um, we can use previous halakha, or halakha in general, as a template, and then adjust based on current circumstances. And that specific statement is something that, and basically that notion is shared, not only between you 
and the majority of uh, rabbis throughout history, right? The, more, the great rabbis that, uh, that any uh, learned Jew studies, but also the majority of rabbis today. That's not a controversial statement. Now, your conclusions from that statement are obviously going to be different with a lot of people. Um, and we can talk about now about why. But first, I want to re- talk about the idea that everything that you've been saying about the concept of halakha is something which is relatively mainstream in Judaism, right? Within Jewish people and Jewish thinkers. Um, you, you mentioned, you started off by talking about the, uh, the court, the great court, which is referenced in Devarim uh, in, 16, in chapter 16 and also in other places throughout the, uh, throughout the Torah. Um, and so basically the, the rabbinic concept, right, is that first off, like you said, Karaites, for example, right, but not, not the only example, um, they don't accept uh, rabbinic halakha, but they have their own halakha, meaning you, one cannot do the commandments of the Torah without halakha. You need to have an oral tradition, an oral custom, which allows you, which gives you the details from which you can do the, the commandments of the Torah, right? That's not something which, that you and I dispute. That's clearly uh, something we both understand just in practice. Um, so the, the main rabbinic uh, um, claim, right, going back to the Hasmonean, to the Maccabee period, after the return from Babylon, is that that court that they maintained during that period was the same court, right, that, was the com- that came from that original court of Devarim chapter 16. Um, and so basically what happened was, is we know that there was a court, right, that was established uh, in ancient Israel, pre-exilic uh, Israel. And what happened was is that the elites were exiled to Babylon. Well, we know anybody who's familiar with the history knows that the entire Judean population wasn't exiled by the Babylonians, but the elites were, the urban elites specifically. And those urban elites included the people that were on that court. So what they did is when they showed up in Babylon, right, they organized the court in Babylon, right? And that court came back to the land of Israel and they assumed Right? And we can talk about whether they were justified or not justified, but just historically speaking, they assumed the role of that continuous court. Right? And certainly, and this is, this is kind of the big rub, is that at that point, the Israelites who had remained in the land during the 70 years that the Judeans were in exile in Babylon, right, they, to, to assert that they didn't have any type of uh, legal uh, life during that time period would be ridiculous. Right? We can assume that they also had um, and an opposing court. And we can see from the text in Nehemiah and in Ezra that they were trying to rejoin with the, uh, return, with the returnees' desire. And they were rebuffed. They were rejected, right? Um, and so whether, we, I mean, we can lament that and we can, you know, talk about uh, what, the, what that means, but it's just a fact of history. And from that time period, right, onwards, all the way up into the Roman exile, Right. You have a great court in Jerusalem and then later in Yavne and then later in the north until the the Byzantine Empire destroys it. Right. That is making these decisions on the collective uh, on behalf of the collective uh, Israelite people. Um, now, of course, we know that there were Israelites that weren't accepting that the Samaritan community in the north or descendants of the northern tribes of Israel that weren't exiled. And of course, we have the northern tribes that were exiled, right? And we can see their descendants in a number of communities that exist today in exile and in the land of Israel. Uh, And this kind of rub between what do we do with people, right, that were exiled before, right, all of these texts were codified, and then are coming back, right? It's a very complex issue. And it's something that has uh, come to the forefront many times in, uh, in Hebrew history, right? We have Communities in India, the Bnei Israel in, in uh, Mumbai, and the Cochin Jews in the south, and obviously, you know, a lot of most people are familiar with the uh, Beta Israel community uh, that was in Ethiopia, um, and these communities, right? They didn't know about a lot of these codifications. Now, what we can do, if we, even when we look at Evo culture and society, and we look at all of these other cultural societies that have a northern Israelite uh, tradition. Um, they, we certainly see that there is a shared uh, oral Torah heritage there, right? There are things that are in the Mishnah that align with things that are done in those communities to this day, right? So certainly that we see that there is a clear um, 
uh, similarity and there's a difference based on what you say, adaptation to uh, different circumstances. So, and we can go through each, in, each specific adaptation, each specific decision which was made by the court. Um, but first, I think it's very important to understand that you know, we're talking ultimately about, you know, facts of history. And most of what you said, I'm not, I'm not even sure I ever will call something which I specifically disagree with, maybe with the, with the matrilineal thing, but we can get back to that in a second. Um, the, the facts are the facts. The issue, though, is then how do you frame that as a philosophy of history, right? In terms of we understand how we view the, the, the uh, events of the past. Do we view it in something which was negative or do we view it in something which was inevitable or even positive, right? This is a complex issue. So what I want to say is that the tradition that I've inherited, right, uh, the tradition that is taught, that I learned in yeshiva, and a lot of, uh, I would venture to say that uh, most uh, Jews learn in yeshiva and Torah learning institutions, is that the purpose of the, of the Hebrew story, right, is one of a constant interaction with the nations of the world. And that doesn't mean interaction in the sense of, okay, we're just going to give up who we are. No, it's the opposite, really. It's the opposite in the sense that, no, we are going to stay who we are, right? The, the, major, the main template of values, customs, and traditions that the Torah gives us, but that is constantly informed by our experiences. And where do we get that from? We get that from the way in which we uh, look at the, the beginning of Hebrew history, right? We start off with the story of, uh, of Abraham, right, of Abraham. Um, and he goes, he goes, he leaves Sumer, right? He leaves the Akkadian civilization, right? To then go to a specific land, right? It's the first thing that, uh, that the creator tells Abraham is you need to go to a land. Why? Because you need to be a specific people, right? You need to be a nation. And, and then after what happens, again, we're going through history very quick because I want to get to the point. From uh, that land, the whole nation goes into Egypt. Why? Right? What we have is that we have this intense process, right, of enslavement, of oppression, the most intense interaction one could have with an other, with an alien society, right? And I'm not talking about the history, I'm talking about what the message is, right? Because what happens is that after the period of enslavement, right, Israel leaves Egypt and they leave with what, right? They leave with the treasures of Egypt. And so we take that as clearly, first of all, they left with material possession, right? But clearly, if you're, so if you're living in a place for more than 200 years, right, you're going to be influenced by the, by the culture. Just think about everybody who's been living in the United States for 100 years, for 200 years, how much Americanness, for better or for worse, we have inherited, right? That's a part of us, right? Likewise, the Hebrews that were in Egypt, that were sojourning in Egypt, were, in, were interacting with that culture. And they left with the treasures. And when they, what they did with those treasures of Egypt, right, they did two things. Number one, they built the golden calf. So clearly here we see that there is something negative, right? That we, in our interaction with the nations of the world, right, we can always take uh, something negative. We can take the bad that comes from that society, that from that civilization, right, and make a golden calf. That's the mistake. But then with the same treasures of Egypt, what do we do later? We melt it down. Right. And we build the Mishkan, we build the tabernacle. Right. So the issue is not whether or not, you know, uh, we're go we have interactions with different civilizations and then we adopt things and we change things. The issue is how we do it. Right. Are we staying true to the cultural values of our civilization or are we betraying them? And this is not to say that we haven't betrayed them in our in our in our ancient uh, uh, history and in our present reality. Certainly, that's a part of our experience as well. Right? But the issue is whether or not we are, are fulfilling our mission of survival as a nation, but also adapting and taking our ancient values for our very contemporary needs. So, so basically, I think when we, when we think about this just in terms of the, the point that you start off with, the matrilineal lineage, um, when the court was making the decisions that it was making during that time period, we have to understand that they weren't making it pure out of the blue. It wasn't something that was coming based on my personal opinion, and this is going to be the best for us because the Romans, certainly those things were, there were considerations, right? Um, but they were also consulting the very ancient sources, right? And specifically when it comes to matrilineal descent, right, a few things that were uh, definitely referred to was the, the, the notion that while 
uh, Isaac and Ishmael were sons of Abraham, right? Ultimately, Isaac was chosen to be the one that would continue. Ishmael gets kicked out, right? And here you can see that there is certainly a spiritual as well as a practical value that's already put on this early stage of Hebrew history towards the mother's role, right? The difference between Sarah and Hagab, right? As, some, as being a constructive spiritual role in Hebrew life. And then another one is where we get all the way to, uh, to um, uh, Leviticus, where we have the story of the son of an Israelite woman and an Egyptian man, right? He ends up doing something, uh, you know, blaspheming the name of, uh, of the, the creator, um, but certainly we see that already in that time period, we have the son of a woman, of an Israelite woman, but there was an Egyptian man. So this is a clear example of, uh, of somebody that was a part of the community, that was part of the nation. And it was also a direct product of that interaction with the Egyptian society, right? So it's this kind of, we're always doing Hebrew uh, scholars or Hebrew sages uh, and laymen. We're always playing this kind of, this uh, back and forth um, uh, wrestling uh, with the foreign cultures that we were surrounded uh, by. Um, and this is something that uh, existed before the exile. So, so obviously we can all point, we can spend from now until tomorrow talking about the different adaptations and changes that were made after the Babylonian exile by the Judean scholars, right? We can certainly do that. But the, we also have to recognize that pre-exilic Torah life, pre-exilic Israelite culture, right, wasn't without these same adaptations and changes, right? Not in the sense of the actual specific laws and customs, but in the sense that that, that society was also deeply influenced by the ancient Egyptian society, right? By, by, by we can look at that by the, the so many different examples where we can see ancient Egypt imprinted on our ancient culture and by the Canaanite nations that it was surrounded with. It was a constant interaction. And the book of, uh, the book of Judges is this, this intense discussion of the deep levels of assimilation, right? Of the golden calves, as opposed to the tabernacles that we were building with these, with these cultural influences, right? And to say that the exiles of uh, the descendants of the Assyrian exile, right? Or even the, uh, the Northern Israelite tribes that stayed in Northern Israel and later formed the Samaritan community that exists to this day, right? To say that they also weren't influenced by those things and made changes based on those uh, on the those sim on similar pressures right is something which i believe is ahistorical right so that's basically my approach to the to the issue okay cool 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 so um and i was absorbing what you were saying um in regards to the adaptation um, or the the need of halakha because again that is uh, when we're trying to make certain things that are implicit in the text explicit, right? Dealing with things that uh, is in regards to code of conduct and protocol, um, as opposed to the agada part of it is just dealing with narratives that apply to humanity in general or specifically to certain events that are specific in regards to Israel. Um, and I thought it was interesting because I wanted to bring something up on the screen real quick from an article that was written by an individual uh, by the name of... Harold Kamsler, you can look him up uh, online, anybody who's watching and check out his credentials. Uh, but he says something very interesting, and this is why I'm, I'm bringing this up for a reason before we, we, we um, transition further. And the thing that I want to bring up, because it's interesting that we don't really have a huge point of contention in regards to uh, the scattering of Israelites into Africa and then amalgamating in regards to uh, uh, other natives that are autochthonous to that, uh, autochthonous to that region. Uh, as well. And um, some of them also had even stayed separate or independent. And we have references for that as well. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to touch on based on something you said, um, and I don't think is a huge uh, point of contention we have there, but I just wanted to explain what my position is and what I represent is that um, when you're dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, academic scholars uh, in the realm of um, African Jewry or Judaistic studies in Africa, um, a lot of times you have a situation where uh, they are at a point where they are denying any kind of uh, contemporary claims to Israelite uh, lineage 
um, from groups that they see as Judaizing movements in Africa. Um, and they don't really see any authenticity in regards to those practices, mainly because you can tell by a lot of those outward practices who influenced them, right? Based on the halakha that they're practicing, uh, based on the minkhag that they even adopting, that's not even indigenous to them in that area. Um, and then it, it creates a very sticky uh, place for them to acknowledge those Judaism movements. However, they do accept a lot of the historical references in regards to uh, Jews or Israelites being in, in particular regions. Um, and I want to bring a few things up real quick that we just put on the table, um, just to get a quick uh, response from you. And then from there, we'll move on to something else. Um, but one thing I wanted to bring up from Harold Kamslar in regards to uh, Minchag and Judaism, he said something that's very interesting um, that I want to put here on the screen. Uh, he says, let me see if I can... Uh, if I can here we zoom in. Uh, the word minchag, which we see here, right? Mem, nun, heg, uh, gimel, is derived from a root to lead. The minchag was a time hallowed, authorized practice as valid as binding as Torah. The Talmud states the minchag of our fathers is Torah, the Menachot 20b. The Shalchan Aruk says, no man can may deviate from the minchag of his city, right? The Orach Hayim 425.1. At times, Minhagim even superseded Jewish law, as the Talmud notes, Minhag overrules law by Baba Metzia 7.1. Now, just so people know, when you go back and you read this, um, there is a particular context. Um, however, uh, the part that we see here that's proof text uh, pretty much explains those scenarios and says, hey, Minhag overrules law in this case, you know, or no man can deviate from the Minhag of the city, or there's a Minhag of customs of our fathers. I give an example of that. Uh, example of that is Abraham. When we go to the book of Bereshit, we see that uh, when he sees those three men that are appearing to him, one of them is yod uh or Theophany, uh, he greets them and he brings them into his home. And one of the things he does uh, as a minchag, as a custom, is washing the feet. And that's something that's, that was done in ancient times. Uh, whenever you displayed hospitality to a guest, uh, it would typically be reserved to a servant. Uh, of someone who's an adon of a home, a servant would be the one that's relegated to actually washing the feet uh, of any guests. However, in this case, um, Abraham decided that he's going to go do it himself. And that was a custom, right? Now, that's something that's not, you know, halachic, that you have to wash feet, you know. Um, however, this is something that was a minchago, a custom, that one group can say, hey, look, since we have an example here from the narrative of Agadah, can we take that and we can put in a situation where this community has a lack of humility, has a lack of greeting, you know, guests or strangers, right? I'll give an example of that. Um, in Bereshit, when uh, Yaakov was sending back um, his sons uh, to Yosef, uh, he told him, hey, look, before you guys go back, we want to bring the best gifts of the land and give it to him, right, as a sign of submission um, and agreeance. And two of those items that we see there are almonds and pistachios, which grows in, 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 in Israel. Uh, so one thing that I've done, again, that I've created in regards to a minchag that we can apply contemporarily today is that when, when I greet guests who either come to my home or when I have my events, um, I give them pistachios and almonds, right? That's a minchag or a custom that I have reintroduced into the community as a means of bringing forth a degree of humility and hospitality that seems to be lost here in American culture, right? So for people who follow my ministry, who are attached in ministry, they see that these are certain things that, you know, that me, myself, I've, I've taken time to reconstruct and implement because it has some means of keeping a protocol, right? And this is how, again, over time, that we can start to use these little things in order to implement our halakha. So in regards to him actually explaining the importance of the minchagim, he says that uh, there's three types. Those would serve as fences around the law to safeguard against any inadvertent violation of the law. Those which inspire the Jew who might have become indifferent to the teaching of Torah. And those that provide an embellishment for the Jew who expresses his love for the mitzvot. For example, the singing of Zemirot on Shabbat Eve or the use of a beautiful covering for the halot, right? So, you know, and just so you can see his uh, credentials here, shows here on the bottom. Uh, so these are things that he's saying that the customs can even be designed as a fence around the halakha 
uh, that the community established with their own big dean, which is my proposal. Um, and in doing so, these things help to infuse things within this community and the diaspora that is necessary in order for them to become autonomous, in order for them to stay true to the template of Torah and being able to express the implicit explicitly based on the needs of the community, right? So that's why I don't believe that those in the diaspora, especially those who are scattered before Talmudic times, uh, should be bounded to something that did not include their particular community, right? Because if we look in, this is one thing that I've brought up in the ISSAJ, which is International Society for the Study of African Jewry. It's an organization. I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, but it was established by Tudor Parfit and Edith Bruder. And Tudor Parfit, um, you know, he's, you know, became an expert in African Judaic studies uh, since he was invited to go and spend time with the Lemba in South Africa. Um, and then from there, he started to uh, investigate other claims uh, as well, uh, claims from uh, Jews in Zimbabwe and Jews in Nigeria. And his understudy, Edith Bruder, did more investigative studies as well uh, on the, the Nigerians, you know, more specifically the Igbo peoples. Um, and one of the things that that is interesting is that when Edith Bruder brings up a reference to the groups that she sees there. And this is, I'm going to show this to you real quick because I think you'll probably find this interesting if you haven't, if you're not already familiar with it. Um, but the one thing that I find that's very interesting uh, that's brought up is in regards to looking at the different groups in that region to try and find out how can we authenticate the jewelry of a people there in that region, right? Um, and one of the things that's interesting is the group that she chooses to investigate which I think was very, very interesting when we take a look at it, that the group that she should have been investigating is really not the group that, you know what I'm saying, was of note in regards to authenticate, authenticating their, their jewelry. Um, and I'll bring it up on the screen right now. So that way, I don't know if you're looking or not, you can see what it is that I'm, I'm talking about. And this is why we have to represent you know, for our community diaspora in these type of settings, these uh, academic settings where conferences are being held about, you know, our, uh, you know, kin in West Africa um, and as well as our ancestors that were migrating in that region in order for us to kind of crack open that time capsule to see, you know, what we're dealing with as far as our heritage, right? So here on the screen, um, I'm gonna showcase something in something very interesting. Um, let me bring it up here real quick and I'll share it. I'm gonna break down, break it down here. And again, this is why I'm saying this, this is why the lens in which uh, a particular culture that has an identity that claims to be Israelite lineage needs to be examined. Uh, there are particulars that need to be looked at. And, and that's why I did my, my previous lecture. So here in the book, African Zion Studies in Black Judaism, edited by Edith Buddha and Tudor Parfit, in chapter two, the proto history of the equal Jewish identity from the colonial period to the Biafra War, 1890 to 1970 by Edith Buddha. We know by 1970, the Biafra War was already over. It was only a three year war and it couldn't have been sustained by the Igbo in that land because they didn't really have advanced weaponry to defend themselves. Um, but one thing that you had noted in regards to the identification of the Igbo being somewhat of closer in class to the colonizers was interesting because when the British uh, left out, they actually gave control to the Fulani Hausa in the north um, because the Igbo were getting entrenched into Western education and they were uh, pretty much finding ways to think tank how to uh, resolve issues in the community post-colonialism, uh, right? And um, that was something that uh, the British saw as a threat. And because the House of Fulani was more subjugative to the benefit that was being given to uh, Nigerians by the British before uh, leaving out, uh, they decided that we're going to rule, you know, through a facade, you know, of the Fulani Hausa. Uh, and if any groups are you know, adverse to that, then they would be put down. Hence why we got the Biafra War, because the Igbo did not agree that the House of Fulani should have been giving rule over Nigeria as a state. Um, so I bring it up to say here, when she's examining these communities, and by the way, Ida Bruder and Tudor Parfits uh, would be individuals who may disagree with things that I say, may agree with things that I say. So I'm not picking a biased source, right, in order to make this point. Uh, she says here, today, three categories of Igbo claim to have a link to Judaism. The Hebrewists, who consider themselves as pre-Talmudic Jews on the basis of their alleged Hebraic traditions of their forefathers. The members of the various recent Jewish congregations who are striving towards Jewish recognition for some years 
And finally, the somewhat different Sabbatarians who number more than two million and who practice a kind of Judaism while also reading the New Testament. Now, I highlighted what's in green for a reason, the Hebrewists. Why do I bring up the Hebrewists? Well, the problem is if you're going to look for authentic Judaism or Israelite lineage in some random remote place in Africa, um, and you see a group there that that has their talit on, as you can see there, and you know they have their their uh, top hats, their black top hats, as you see here in the image, and you know their dress is not akin to the native dress of that land. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we we can we know and we can chart back where a lot of this goes back to, like whose customs and uh, what group. I'm just gonna mute you for a second, um, Yim Yahoo, because I hear some background noise. Um, so anyway, uh, so we, we can tell by just by looking at that group, if you was going in and say, okay, let me see if they are uh, authentic, you're looking at a form of Ashkenazim Jewry, all right? You're not looking at authentic uh, Hebraic Jewry, quote unquote, or Israelite culture that you would find native to that region. The reason why is because if you go back to the oral tradition, and remember, the reason why uh, you can even have an Israelite oral tradition amongst the Igbo communities, because there is no uh, antiquated records in regards to the provenance or origin of this these group of peoples. Right. So some people have come up with uh, their own, you know, interpretations of, you know, where this group came from and who are who they who are they are. So from my particular position, I say that, you know, they are an amalgamation of various peoples who have came from different regions. There are some uh, theories that say that they've, you know, just a group of cross speaking peoples that came from Lakoja and migrated south and ended up in present day Igbo land. Um, there's some that say that they've came directly from the Orient or from uh, the East and migrated there and became the peoples in that region. And then there's some that talks about the amalgamation of both groups, uh, you know, a migration from the East and a migration from the Koja coming down on, on that area and merging, right, into a point where you have acculturation and enculturation that occurs that now when you have later, uh, missionaries that come and, and look at these people and live amongst them, for example, G.T. Baston, you see a situation where he says in his preface, he said, man, the best way to understand these people is to read the Levitical law. Because while he was speaking to them, he would say things from out the text and they would be like, well, how'd you learn about my culture? Like, how did you know about that? And they would press uh, to want to get the text in their language, native language, so they can try to see how this white man knows anything about our culture. Where is this coming from? Um, but the problem with academia today is that when they go and they look for authentic Judaism, and they're looking at these groups that look like converts because a lot of the information they got is from, you know, Ashkenazim individuals that's ventured into Nigeria for economic purposes or whatever. Um, and, and, and upon hearing certain legends in regards to, hey, these people may be part of the lost tribes. Um, and then during the 60s and going on later to the early 2000s and so forth, when they get access to the Internet, they're actually looking at the customs and practices of what's being done by Ashkenazim Jews as a template for what they should be doing. The problem with that is that when you look at the Hebrewists, they say, look, you know, we we uh, already subscribe to having Hebrew lineage. However. We're not going to adopt what looks like rabbinic Orthodox Judaism. Because that is not what we developed coming here into this land. Ani in Igbo means land, right? Odinani is the things that you do within the land, right? Omenala or Omenana is the customs, you know, that's intertwined with the things that are done in the land in order for you to be aligned with the chief deity. Um, and they simply say that, hey, we've developed our own halakha and we've developed our own minhagim and it's applied based on where we are in the land. For example, their staple crop is yams, right? You don't have yams as a staple crop in Israel. So if you have a group that are Israelites that are migrating to someplace foreign and they setting up shop there, obviously they have to deal with whatever they have access to. And it's not going to be your barley and your wheat that you would normally have for Aviv, right? It would be based on whatever that crop harvest is during that period of time and how they adapt to the things in the land. So what they say is when you go into our native culture, you'll see that we do a lot of things. For example, you have to 
uh, Milah that you do as far as circumcision. You have the name and ceremony and all of that. Well, the Igbo has a form of that, right? They have their eighth day circumcision. They also have their name and ceremony. They also have their menstrual seclusion that you also see in the Torah that they also apply there as well. But it's different because it's based on how they adapt it to that region. And again, these are natives and you have foreigners that have amalgamated and created an enculturated group. That's there. So we see the insemination of these things within that culture. So in, in, in dealing with that, the problem with academia is that they don't want to look at these Hebrewists, examine their culture to see if they have any validity in regards to their claims of their Ming Hagim and Halakha based on a template of Torah that they've applied in that region. And also, just like we have the Polish Jews, you know, the Polish dress that you have for the Hasidic Jews that comes from Poland. That was Polish culture or Polish Ming Ha custom, right? That that should not should not be binding to any other uh, Israelites that's in the diaspora anywhere because that they had they were not rubbing shoulders with those indigenous groups. If if we're gonna look at uh you know Israelites here in America, we need to be looking at the groups that we have the closest assembly towards and affinity towards and shared experiences with, and those would be those in West Africa because that's how we should establish our modern or contemporary halakha for the needs of us being here in the Americas, because we have a totally different situation going on than what's going on in Israel, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Asia. So this is why I'm pushing when I'm on these panels and when I'm in these discussions with this organization to say, hey, look, examine the Hebrewists and look at these things. And I go and I parse out what we have in ancient pre Israelite culture, and I show the close affinities that that has to what we see indigenous in West Africa, as opposed to second temple Judaism, which would look a little bit more foreign because of the Sahedrin rulings and so forth to establish a form of halakha that would be indifferent to those who develop it outside the land of Israel, right? So this is extremely important because I, I want, you know, communities in, in Israel, I want Jewish communities here in America, not to downplay the the case that can be made for us here, you know, and going into just this quick references, I wanted to bring up several things, but I'll, I'll condense it for time. Um, if we look at, you had mentioned um, um, El Dachadani, right? Uh, the Danite and the word of him that had went back into North African uh, Jewish communities in regards to what he discovered um, in the river, uh, Sambation, you know what I'm saying, or the Shabbat river. Uh, where it flows six days of the week and the rest on the seventh day of the week and all these different tales that he was saying, but he acknowledged that there were some Northern tribes that were there. And it's interesting that when he had mentioned that uh, he gave particular details. Also, uh, one of the rituals for performing sacrifice is contained in his halakha from his own work, which I've done a lot of studies on. We find similar methods for foul sacrifice in West Africa, Right. Because then we get to other references from other people like Leo Africanus, who also mentions about these uh, Jews that are living in between Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia and the Congo region. He makes reference to Jews that were living in that region, which goes in alignment with what Eldad Khadani was saying with those Jews that were living there. Not only that, we also have references where letters were written to these groups over time to request assistance from these groups. Vilna Gaon's uh, students actually wrote a letter, you know, what I'm saying to these groups that actually lived in that region uh, because they was looking for insights because they believed that these groups were well established, their autonomous communities and was looking for insight from these groups. Uh, so that way they can learn how to adapt to their situation that was going on in Germany um, and other parts of Europe where they felt that they were being oppressed. So they was looking for these individuals that were there, and I have it on my screen, where they says, thus send the dwellers of the land of Israel who abide by the Torah of Moses, which is a gift and inherited portion to our brothers, the children of Israel, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, who revealed himself in Hashem. Uh, they are our holy and pure brothers, the righteous upon whom the world rests, the Bene Moshe, servant of Hashem, who dwell across the river Shevation, uh, also known as Sambation. Right. And who pledge allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne, who rules over the 10 tribes, whose settlement is in the land of beyond the rivers of Nubia, Cush, who camp according to their band as the tribe of Dan, of Tali, Gad and Asher, the tribe of Essekar. It says um, the tribe of Zebulon, Reuben, Ephraim, um, Menashe and the tribe of Shimon. May Hashem be with them. So they write in a letter to these tribes that are there based on 
what they're hearing about what is going on in that region. And then we also see later explorers or travelers uh, that are also making mention to groups that are there in that region as well. And then when we go to Christian Oldendorf, uh, who was the individual that came about from, uh, he was German, but he was sent by the Dutch to go and look at the Moravian Brotherhood in the Virgin Islands. And that's where my mother's side of the family comes from the Virgin Islands. It's interesting because we have the Dutch Jews that was involved in the slave trade in that region uh, as well. And I have the, uh, the sources for that if we wanna bring it up later on for our final point. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, looking at these, when we talk about authenticated primary sources, secondary sources, we see these references that are there. We even uh, have uh, from the Talmud itself, from Sanhedrin 94b, where there's a reference where it says, well, where are the 10 tribes scattered? And one of the rabbis say to Africa, to Africa, you know, that this is where they're scattered based on uh, their understanding of the migrations routes in that region. So when Christian Oldendorf is getting references from an uh, African slave, that is telling him that there are black Jews that reside in the Wango kingdom. And we know the Wango kingdom is being run by the Bili peoples. Uh, it's very interesting because one of the things that he, he says in his work is he talks about burial customs. Now, if we go into the burial customs of uh, various group of Jews around the world, there are very distinct things that are contained in burial customs. And if you see these things that are distinct, you know that if they differentiate themselves from, let's say, Portuguese Jews, or Sephardic Jews, or Ashkenazim Jews, or Mizrahadi Jews, or Yemenite Jews, we can tell that this is an isolated group that is distinct, that have adopted and created their own minkagim and halakha in order to deal with things that are discussed in the Torah, in the text. And we go into the Niger River, like you had mentioned earlier, we have a reference from John Ogilvy, who references that we have uh, Jews who are natives who say they come from Abraham's seed on both sides of the Niger River, right? Well, if you go into a temporary resource from that to the uh, Tariq al Fatash, you have al Tash, you have a reference where in Turderma you have Jews that are residing there in Mali on the opposite sides of the river Niger, right? And then we then see that there were trading routes uh, coming into Nigeria because the Igbo were also traders. Right. And they've been traders for a long time. You know what I'm saying? So we see a flow of or references from Jews that are here in these regions along the Niger River. And then we also see another flow come from the east, coming down from Egypt, where we have, like you had mentioned in Elephantine, you had a community that was there where we now looking at the P. M. Hearst manuscripts, see that there are northern tribesmen that live there in Elephantine. And a lot of them then migrated south where you get the Dan and Gad migration that goes southward into what we call Ethiopia today. And then some believe the head went further down. That's how we get some of the limba uh, in South Africa today as well. But then we also see a migration west because also in the Tariq al Fatash, we see that there were migrations that were taken in the Sahel route from, from uh, Ethiopia, uh, or excuse me, Sudan to Chad, and from there over to uh, West Africa. So we have various sources of Jews being all in Africa, whether it's West Africa, Central Africa, Northeast Africa, or even the, like the ones we know about in North Africa, especially the ones mingled with the Berbers, uh, we see them all throughout Africa. So for anybody to downplay uh, anybody that looks at, you know, or builds a case to support this, it becomes to me very biased when it's denied up front. And the reason why I want to bring this out is because a generation like you that's coming up, who's very young, 25, and you're in Israel, and you get into your academic studies and still hold it on to your traditional rabbinic teachings as well from the yeshiva, uh, they need to understand that a different holistic approach needs to be taken in regards to looking at these things in order to come to a common ground for a discussion in regards to who is considered a Jew today and who's not, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm done just off of that. I just wanted to put that out there um, because... You know, for the sake of this discussion, it may be something that you can elaborate on briefly. I just want to ask you one last question. And from there, uh, I'm going to let you uh, give your perspective. And then I would like to open up the panel for people to ask questions, make comments, for both me and you. Um, but I really just wanted to know, you know, a quick feedback from the, some of the stuff that I've said. But also, I just want to know from you in regards to your knowledge of any Dutch Jews or Jews in general uh, that was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Right. Um, I want to know your perspective on that. If you have any knowledge or understanding of that, what's your take on that? And that would lead into any, you know, uh, descendancy from those Jews um, or any organizations, corporations, businesses that they were able to derive um, from their, uh, you know, travels in the Caribbean and establishment of, um, you know, various slave, you know, 
endeavors, you know, slave trade endeavors. Um, and again, we know they made up a smaller percentage, about maybe 17% in regards to the Caribbean trade, but that's still a significant portion if that is overlooked and it's not addressed, right? And I'm not saying that that's you or your your family line or whatever, but I'm saying this as far as the Jewish community in general, um, you know, is can this be authenticated in your eyes? Um, do you see this as something that is uh, justifiable, right, in regards to enslaving peoples and putting them into coerced labor? Um, and then in order to get them to comply, to actually, you know, torture them in certain cases, beat them in certain cases, deprive them in certain cases, um, this stuff is this important. And I just want to know what is your take on that? So you can give a few words in regards to what I had put on the table and then please uh, address uh, your perspective from your understanding in regards to Jews' involvement in regards to the transatlantic slave trade. All right, thank you. So you touched on a lot, and I'm trying to so I'm trying to keep my responses as, uh, as short as possible. Uh, first, I think it's important to you brought up your explanation of minhag is something which I think is very important. I think you accurately de uh, depicted what is minhag, what is custom within the Hebrew context. Um, but so it's important though, once we understand what minhag is, is how to differentiate between that and halakha, which I think you also did. But it's all, when we understand all these different um, quotes from the uh, Gemara, from the from the uh, from the, the Talmud that talks about the importance of minhag, we have to understand that when we're viewing the perspective of the Hebrew sages that formed um, Hebrew life, Judaism as we know it. Uh, in the Maccabean period, all the way through the Bar Kokhba revolt and afterwards, it was extremely important for them to maintain uh, a Judean unity, right? A unity in practice and custom. Not in the sense that uh, custom couldn't vary from place to place. As you saw, uh, it was saying that if you're in a specific city, right, and that's the custom, then that's the custom that you should follow. That means that if it could be another Judean city, uh, another city with a uh, with Judean refugees, right? And they would have a different custom and that would be perfectly okay. Um, the so, so that's incredibly important because ultimately when it comes to minhag, when it comes to custom, right? And that's the these kind of non-binding, um, uh, basically fences to, to enrich Jewish life and, and practice of Hebrew law. Um, these were things that are not binding on all of the people of Israel. So, and that's extremely important because ultimately what we're talking about, right? Um, uh, we're talking about the, the goal, the long-term goal of, of the Hebrew people. It's not to be separated in, in different tribes, right? I mean, ultimately the, it was incredibly important for the, for the sages, for the Hebrew sages that wrote the, and codified the Mishnah and the Talmud, that we wouldn't be in a situation like in, uh, like in the book of Judges in Shoftim, right? That every man did what was right in his own eyes, right? That's not the, the situation which we want to be. So we want to have, ultimately, the goal is um, some level of unity um, in terms of not uniformity, but unity in terms of the observance of the law so that we can ultimately, uh, you know, be together in a single community, not separated with completely different um, uh, customs. For example, like you mentioned the 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 Eba adaptation to the yam as opposed to wheat and barley in the land of Israel. Now that there there is an Eba community in the land of Israel in the state of Israel today, in case people weren't aware of it, and so ultimately, uh, when we're talking about specific laws in terms of tilling the land, using the using its resources, uh, making offerings to to the Creator, all these different things that we would want to reenact right now that the Hebrew people have. Uh, have uh, sovereignty in their homeland, right? We wouldn't say, like, let's say that there was a specific individual or a community that says, no, we want to now replace wheat and barley with yam because yam is what we use when we were in exile. So th then you see that there's a place there for where we want to create some type of unity and practice, right? And so that's where we would then say, okay, we don't get rid of the yam, right? There's no reason to have to get rid of certain customs, right? And say that they're less important or less valid than customs that were created anywhere else. They're equally valid. Right? But we do want to have the ability to come together. Right? And so this is something that's very important in terms of uh, practical um, you know, revitalization of Hebrew life. Um, I just want to mention, right, you're talking about, we're speaking about the, the Igbo and those various groups 
Certainly, it's an incredible mistake to look at those various groups that identify as Hebrews in Igbo society, which pretty much all of Igbo society, as uh, all of Igbo society, sorry, uh, identifies as Hebrew. It's incredibly, it's a, certainly a mistake to only look at the ones that are adopting rabbinical Judaism. Right. We have to understand that there is a bigger story there, right? And so, I mean, I have, there's a quote, I mean, I don't have the page up on the first, but anybody can look it up. The book, Half of a Yellow Sun, written by uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, she uh, writes in the book, she's talking about the circumstances that led up to the genocide of Igbo in the Uh, British, hey. um, hello. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You you cut out you cut out for a minute, but go ahead. Okay, so one of the quotes in the book from a somebody who's representing the British perspective in Nigeria is it says, you know, with the she's referring to the Igbo. She says, "quote With their being so clannish and uppity and controlling the markets, very Jewish, really, and to think that they are relatively uncivilized, right? So the situating of the Igbo as this kind of uh, this kind of ethnic group that was be, that would be in trading, that would be focused with money, right? They would never put them in the in the in the position of absolute power. And you can see this as a theme in every society in which Hebrews have inhabited, it, particularly in Europe, where they never gave them the full power, but they situated them particularly in something like um, uh, mercantile and uh, money handling and and uh, basically things of that nature, because those were the the sections of society that are most despised. Right. And that ultimately led to the dispossession um, and the intense persecution of evil people in Nigerian society for this specific uh, um, uh, libel. I'm, uh, Imadu Bello, who was the, the leader of the House of Fulani people in Nigeria uh, in, uh, 19, uh, in 1960s, in 1967, right, right before the genocide, he goes on this whole speech where we're basically he's saying is that you put, a, you put an Igbo into uh into a, a work camp and then in a, in a in moment's notice he will be controlling all of the workers right so meaning mm -hmm. that he's not going to be the somebody who's in, in, in charge of the whole camp but he will then be the, the one that's then uh using his power and his position to then manipulate the rest so this same anti-semitic uh kind of stereotype that we recognize from the way the Jews were described in European society and white supremacy right it was the same thing that was used to target uh Igbo people um up until today um so ultimately going back to the issue right of of custom and and adaptations according to the various uh, diaspora situations it's incredibly important obviously that when we're talking about the reconstitution of the nation of israel right that we view every single community's customs right as equal to each other as we view every single is not only just equal but as an inherent uh valued expression of Hebrew culture and society, right? The idea, this kind of feeds into the notion, right? That uh, the, the, my philosophy of Hebrew history, right? The, the, the philosophy of Hebrew history, which is, which is taught in, in uh, many, if not most yeshivot, is this idea that we're constantly in interaction with the world, right? The same thing accompanies the nation of Israel in exile, right? We, had, it, we weren't, history happened the way it happened for a reason. Right, that's, that's something that's inherent to the to the Jewish and to the Hebrew perspective of of uh, of the world, right? And so, if Hebrews were sent to be in exile in West Africa, there's something important that we needed to learn in that experience in West Africa. If Hebrews were sent to exile in uh, in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in the Pale of Settlement. There's something important that the collective Hebrew nation needs to learn from that experience, right? Same thing for Ethiopia, same thing for Yemen, same thing for the rest of the of the Hebrew world. And this is why it's another important thing to emphasize, right? Rabbinic Judaism, rabbinic Jewry does not equal Ashkenazi, right? These are things that are often conflated, right? The, the majority, the Hebrew of rabbinic, the center of rabbinic learning, right, for uh for more than a thousand years right after the exile was in uh babylon right it was in the it was in the eastern area right the eastern exiles the communities that were there since the babylonian exile right and from there uh hebrews spread out judeans spread out to india to yemen all over north africa right and of course europe so those communities maintain different customs different minhagim right but, main, but also 
the shared tradition of halachic observance. So today, right, when we see like in the in the state of Israel, we have a we have convergence, right? Already from before, from the, throughout the end of the the twentieth century uh, until today, we have this convergence, this confluence of Hebrew exiles from all over the world, right? And there was country, there was certainly, it's not like everything was like, oh, okay, we're all gonna mold together and everything's gonna be perfect. No, there was certainly uh, an intense um, uh, conflict in the sense of, okay, we have different customs, you have different customs, how are we gonna make something which is joined together, right? And a lot of the great rabbis uh, of uh, Israeli history were great rabbis that focus on the way in which we can build a joint Israelite uh, spiritual practice and culture, right? And there's so many different details of that. There's a ling there's a linguistic aspect. There's the religious aspect, spiritual aspect, the custom aspect, the legal aspect. There's so many the layers to it, right? But for example, at my synagogue, right, where I go to pray on 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 uh, Shabbat, on, on the Sabbath, and on holy days, is a uh, a Beta Israel, a uh, a Ethiopian synagogue, right? In that synagogue, right, they have customs that they brought from Ethiopia, from their uh, more than two, almost 3,000 years of exile in uh, the Gondor region of Ethiopia, and in a very rich, ancient, northern Israelite even um, uh, history. Um, and so those things are things that they kept in addition to that, right? Not, not in a way to say that, okay, we can't do that, uh, and we, or we should only do that, but they do that and they combine that with um, the, uh, the the a lot of the legal um, and so basically the halachic and the uh, minhagic framework that was also uh, preserved by other communities. So it's, you kind of have this this blending, right? This 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 reunification of a Hebrew society on a very complex and meaningful level. Um, and so this obviously there's, it's 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 not something which is simple, but it's something that needs to be a constant dialogue. And when we're talking about again the value of appreciating the experience of various communities in exile, right? This certainly goes both ways, right? And this is not to say that um, you know there aren't Jews, whether they might be of Yemenite background or or uh, a, a, a Babylonian, right, Iraqi Hebrew background or Ashkenazi Hebrew background. There aren't in the wrong when it comes to their rejection, right, of uh, these um, re-emerging Hebrew communities in West Africa or and even in the Americas, right? There, there certainly are, but it, the knife cuts both ways. And that's why it's also important that we understand that this demonization, right, of Ashkenazi Hebrews because they were in exile in Europe is an ultimate perversion of their history. Because ultimately what we're talking about here, right, we're talking about specifically about dress, for example, when you brought up the dress. If you look at pictures of the Polish nobility's dress, from the 18th century, from the 19th century, from the, from the 17th century, it looks very different from the from the from the type of dress that you see uh, worn by Hasidic Jews today. So I'd say that you don't see a clear overlap. There is, but there's also very clear differences, right? Correct. And then those differences are in the coloring, and it's also in the way that it's that, that it, they were adapted. And basically, what it attests to is that up until very relatively late in uh, Hebrew history in Central and Eastern Europe, right? Hebrews, Judeans, the descendants of Judean exiles, refugees and slaves in Europe were wearing a distinctive Hebrew dress, right? And there's so many different things we can point to for this, but you can see it just in the way that the Hasidic dress adapted to the, to the circumstances in which they were living, right? So this isn't to say that now that means, oh, I can appreciate the, uh, what we can see is in the, the the what became the Creole culture of Ashkenazic Hebrews in Europe, right? So that means that I have to adopt it. No, certainly not, right? It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that we need to appreciate it within its historical context and also look for the parallels in the in the Hebrew experience in other places, right? That for example, the there's there was a certain trajectory which then led for uh, Hebrews in the Niger River that became the Ebos to develop their form of dress, right? The adoption of the Fez, right? Is a fascinating example of this interaction between Ebro, Ebo and North African Jewry, right? So it's, 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 there's so many layers to it, but it's important to understand that when we're talking about this, the long-term goals 
where we're thinking about how it is that we want to see ourselves in the future. And like you, I appreciate that you mentioned, right, as a new generation talking about, uh, you know, creating a new discourse, a new dialogue towards leading ourselves to the next chapter of Hebrew history. And that has to be one in which we not only are appreciating the differences in our experiences and the meaning of those differences, right, and the responsibilities that it then gives us in this generation, but also the shared experience, right? Because those, those are the places in which we can see ultimately the, old, the, the vision of the prophets, the vision of our ancestors, right, was one in which we can see the, the, uh, the staff of, of Joseph and the staff of, uh, of Judah reunited, right? So this is something with it, that's something that we've been dreaming about for thousands of years and something in which we have the ability to do in our lifetime. Um, so uh, let now me, let me, that um, let me, let me, let me, let me, I believe most of the things I wanted to touch on uh, with yeah, regards let me, to what let me, you just uh, said, I will talk about the last me. point. Um, Can you hear me? And that Hello? is with uh, the specifically you mentioned the Dutch, uh, Can you hear Dutch me? Jewish involvement Yahoo. in the slave trade um, in the Caribbean. Yem, Yem Yahoo. Okay, so first of all, Yem Yahoo. I think you Can asked you, you know in terms of the, if there's any type of excuse Yem Yahoo. Can you hear me? Um, for any involvement in chattel slavery, and of course you hear me? the resounding answer is absolutely Hello. no. There's no excuse, right? It's a horrible evil. It's an evil which my ancestors suffered, don't hear me. right? And it's something which all of your uh, ancestors suffered as well. Um, and it's something that obviously anybody that was involved in that was involved in an evil, horrible me? enterprise, right? Now, um, the issue though is that the the Jewish involvement, right, in the the slave trade in general, right, and specifically if you want to talk about the Dutch. Right? It's, it's, it's never given any context, right? It's mean, never given any context and the context is key, right? Because you will see a lot of people um, on the far right in American society, I would say, say um, ultra-right white supremacists who try and obfuscate the issue of slavery by saying, oh, but you know, there was Africans that were enslaving as well, right? Or Africans were involved in the enslavement of, uh, of African people and um, and there was also African, free African and so-called colored slave owners in the South. And so therefore we're absolved, right? That's basically what they're saying. And that's a horrible thing to say. That's what they say. So just as that's evil and terrible because it obfuscates from the, the main uh, problem of white supremacy, right? That led to the enslavement of African people, focusing on the Jews, right? Or the Jewish people that were involved in uh, in enslavement, right, is also a terrible obfuscation from the main issue, which is white supremacy. And so, why why is that? Why am I saying that, right? Because we have to look at what the history of this was, right? You mentioned specifically Dutch Jews. Well, who were the Dutch Jews? The Dutch Jews were entirely in that time in that period, right? Um, specifically, the ones we're speaking about, Sephardic Jews. Right, and I know that from from uh, you know it's it's you you certainly view and, and understand the deep uh, roots of Sephardic Jewry of Iberian Jewry to the land of Israel and to their and to that uh, and to their Hebrew ancestry, right? So these uh, Jews were in Spain, in Iberia, and they were um, persecuted on account of their on their of their Judaeans, right of their hebrew ancestry of their religion certainly but if it took a specific racial term right so in 1492 all of the jews were fit were given a, uh, the option to either convert or be expelled from the iberian peninsula right first spain did it and portugal did it right after um and while and so, and for, certainly many an innumerable amount did choose to be forcibly converted into christianity and they became known as the new christians right Ma the majority fled right and they fled to a number of places and when, after that happened the spanish put in a uh a legal system called limpieza de sangre which means purity of blood and what they did basically is they said that even if you became a christian it wasn't enough to be a part, an equal part of Spanish Iberian society because, because your blood was dirty. You had this Judean ancestry. And so therefore you could never be fully equal with a European Christian, right? And this was something that followed uh, Jewish refugees to the new world, right? And those Jews that fled to the new world, right? Um, some of them did participate in the slave trade. 
right? And they were like, for example, we have a we have a record of uh, of like you said, Jews that fled from Spain to uh, the Netherlands, and then as after being a part of Dutch society, they participated in the in the slave trade, right? And again, absolutely something which is was despicable, right? And then when they went to the Americas to participate in that slave trade, um, they were also followed by anti-Semitism. Right, they were after in the uh, basically in um, the in 1885, uh, uh, right? Or sorry, 1685. You have uh, Jews being expelled entirely from all of the French islands, right? And they were there. They were Dutch Jews that had got. They were there. They had moved to those regions. Sephardic Jews, all of them, uh, and they were expelled from the French islands. They were involved. They were moved uh, as refugees, right? in uh, Brazil, and then they were expelled uh, from Brazil, right? There was all this kind of, uh, uh, basically this interaction between this Sephardic, uh, these Sephardic Jewish refugees and uh, the slave trade and European uh, civilization was something which was basically a horrible chapter of, of, uh, of, of Hebrew history, right? Because what we have is something where we see is this, um, European desire to situate Hebrews as this um, uh, intermediary ethnic group, this group which is then used to do their dirty work, was something which was certainly seen within this chapter of the New World Exploration and the transatlantic slave trade. And we have a lot of uh, Spanish records that are basically uh, trying to target the Sephardic Dutch uh, Jewish uh, traders as saying, look, look what they're doing. They're trying to uh, take control of uh, of uh, the trade on these various Caribbean islands because they're trying to get back at Spain, right? This was the the Spanish kind of conspiracy about what was going on. Um, ultimately, when you look at all the numbers, right? And I think, and uh, specifically, if you look at um, the uh, the the full um, texts which are written by scholars on the subject of the Jewish uh, contribution to the uh, slave trade, it's important to point out a few things. Number one, that the num the majority of the transatlantic slave trade, the bulk of slaves that were taken from uh, West Africa to the New World was done in the period in which um, the British um, and the uh, French were in, the, uh, were in control of slave trade, which was in the 1840s. And the part in which uh, Jews were most involved was when the Dutch were at their heyday, which was when the in the lowest amount of, of slaves were brought to the New World. And within those Dutch traders, if you look at all of the names which were given, uh, Judeans, Sephardic Jews only comprise uh, between six to ten percent, right? So again, that six to ten percent, which was certainly involved, right? Inexcusable, right? Inexcusable, a contribution to something which was certainly uh, evil, and anybody that can uh, trace something to the specific um, Sephardic Hebrew families that were involved, right? Should I, I certainly have no issue, no qualms. I don't think anybody would have any qualms of them demanding some type of restitution or justice from those from those families, right? The problem is is that that minority uh, Hebrew participation, Sephardic Hebrew participation in the slave trade is then focused on, right, to the to exclusively by people who then have a uh, a anti-Semitic agenda to focus only on the Jews, as opposed to the vast majority of profiteers, investors, and traders who were European uh, and Christian. Right, and that is something that is the main point because ultimately what we're talking about is this was a white supremacist uh, system that certainly uh, victimized and uh, and basically uh, destroyed the lives of Africans on the most intense level, but also was a system which uh, persecuted and exiled and attacked these same Sephardic Jews that were participating in it. Right, so we're talking about ultimately the uh, kind of the reproduction of the same uh, anti-Semitic structures that basically made Ebos the convenient, um, the convenient enemy, the convenient scapegoat um, for their position of, of relative privilege in, Niger in colonial Nigeria, and certainly for the, uh, for the um, 
for the Sephardic Jew, Jewish refugees that ended up, um, that took part in the uh, slave trade. Um, one of the, again, the unfortunate and basically the distortion of history is this attempt of people on basically on, on also this idea is popular in neo-Nazis and uh, with David Duke and also with uh, espousers of the ideology of, uh, of Farrakhan is this idea that the, that Jew, the Jewish collective today, um, and particularly the Jewish collective in America, is responsible for the for the actions of these uh, uh, individual Jews and Jewish families um, that were Sephardic, right? Uh, when the majority of the Jews in America are Ashkenazi, right? It's something which is clearly a distortion of history, right? I consider you to be a part of the Hebrew family, right? And I'm sure that you consider Yemenite. Uh, Jews to be a part of the Hebrew family, and you consider, um, you know, Sephardic Jews part of the Hebrew family, North African Jews part of the Hebrew family, right? So if there were individual, uh, and we know that there were individual um, Sephardic Jews that were involved in doing something evil in the New World, right? That doesn't mean then that we then pull over, hey, Yemenite uh, Jew, you know, you you have to you you are now held responsible for everything that they did as well, right? That's something that I would assume that you wouldn't do. So doing that, doing that and applying that Thank standard you. to Yahoo. Ashkenazi Jews in general, Ashkenazic Jewry, right, is something which is a distortion of uh, history. And I think it's Hello? unhelpful in our long-term roles. Oh, can you hear me, Yim Yahoo? Hello? Yim Yahoo, can you hear me? You with me, uh, Ron? Yes, I, I think you have me muted. I think he muted me. Ron, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Let me communicate in the back chat. Let me see. You hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, cool. Because I think you had me muted on your side, right? Uh, I might have accidentally. My apologies. Okay. No, it's okay. It's cool, cool. All right. So um, just uh, two things I want to say real quick. Uh, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. I'm going to mute you real quick. Um, so two things I want to say. Um, uh, first thing I want to say, thank you for the feedback. Uh, I see what your angle is and your approach. And it's good that we're just freestyling like this because... Um, it's informal and it's just a way for me to kind of assess what your position is to see if there's anything really diametrically uh, opposed to mine that we can probably have a more structured discussion on. Um, but this right here just seems like it's a bill. So it's really good. Uh, one thing I want to two things I want to bring to your attention. One thing I had a question. But the second thing, since we're just on the, the slavery thing is, again, my statement was um, I'm not saying that all Jews have to pay for what some group did. What I'm saying is the groups that benefited from that, right? Because we have the records, right? The groups that have benefited from that, right? Um, they should be held liable for the damages incurred to the injured party in which they had involved themselves in regards to the slave trade is concerned. Now, like I said, the Virgin Islands, where my mother's side of the family come from, had the Dutch there who colonized them initially. And then they also had Jews that came there and was involved with the slave trade in that area. Now we know what Jews these are, right? So it's not a mystery anymore. Like we know where the money trail is at. I'm saying the community collectively, the Jewish community collectively needs, if, if they are sympathizers or empathizers as they want the, you know, the world to be in regards to what occurred to certain Jewish groups uh, in Germany, and mind you, that's not all Jews, right? That's just a particular group of Jews in Germany that was afflicted and that was persecuted. I'm simply saying is that if they want to continue to have the empathy from people of color on this side of the margin, um, they also have an, a duty to ensure that if any of their fellow brethren have committed any acts uh, that go against you know, any kind of uh, moral or civil laws in regards to uh, inalienable rights that human beings have by nature, um, then they need to outwardly condemn these acts that occurred uh, in regards to the translated slave trade and acknowledge the contribution that some Jews have done 
in regards to the transatlantic slave trade and try to find a means of assisting African Americans in getting the reparations in regards to the damages owed from that particular situation. And I want to pull some some sources on the screen, but again, I know we pressed for time and I want to open up the panel before others come on. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was something very interesting because you had mentioned to me that you have lineage from Guyana, which I thought was interesting because in this article here, this article, you can go read it online. It's from the Times of Israel, right? Um, it's a publication, you know, uh, periodical in Israel. Uh, they said something very interesting here. They say here, in one area of what used to be Dutch Guyana, 40 Jewish owned plantations were home to a total population of at least 5,000 slaves. He says, this is who we're talking about right here. All right, the individual's name. So in case you want to go back and research it, right? Rabbi Lottie Van de Kep, they, they comp, right? He says, known as the Jordan Zavan or Jewish Savannah, the area had a Jewish community of several hundred before its destruction in a slave uprising in 1832. Nearly all of them immigrated to Holland, bringing their accumulated wealth with them. Some of that wealth was on display last year in the cell of Amsterdam's Portuguese synagogue, part of an exhibition celebrating the riches of the synagogue's immigrant founders. Van den Kamp says the expedition sparked his interest in a just Jewish role in slavery, which was robust. So again, they know the paper trail. They know the families. They know where this is at. What I'm saying is if the Jewish community wants to close the gap in regards to having additional sympathy from the black community, then they need to call these things out and find a way based on their experience of being, you know, tortured and uh, persecuted and placed in force or coerced labor in Germany to find a way to look at other injustices that have been done for other peoples through other Holocaust, other sacrifices that others have made off the backs of others in order to uh, bring back the wealth to the economic interests of the native lands, right? Or in this case, if they're coming to the, the uh, Western hemisphere back to their own native lands, to call these things out and to get involved in the reparations discussion, even if they're not involved, because black people are now suffering from post-traumatic slave disorder based on all the things that have occurred to them in a perpetual slavery that occurred for hundreds of years, not just six years, five years, seven years, but we're talking about hundreds of years, whereby there were some Jews, and again, if people call them their brothers, you need to call them out and say, hey, look, what you did was wrong. And if you, I don't know if you realize that history as far as Guyana, I've done a lot of research in regards to the Dutch Jews because of my connection with, with the Virgin Islands. But if you go back and research it, we know where those plantations are. We know the family names. We have all that information. They might have even enslaved some of your mother's side of the family. You know what I'm saying? If you go back and research it, you know what I'm saying? They may have been slaves there. You know, you go back and check it out. You know, I think that this is a very interesting history, but I just want to know your opinion in regards to reparations. You know, what should the next steps be? You know, again, I'm not demonizing all Jews. I'm saying when we know names and we can connect dots, what will be the next step as a collective community? And after that, I got one last question and then I'm going to open up the panel. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and I'm going um, to let you respond. Yeah. So first of all, that's a great question. I think it touches on a lot of different issues. And first of all, I am familiar of the history of Yodin Savannah in, uh, in what is today uh, Suriname, Dutch Guyana. Um, and I think it's important to bring up a couple of things. First of all, um, when we're talking about the history of Sephardic Jewish refugees and their role in the enslavement of uh, African people in the New World, we have to understand first and foremost that the majority of them, the majority of the names that fill kind of these chat rooms that are fill up the the uh, books of the secret relationship between uh, blacks and Jews. Um, first of all, it's important to mention that in terms of a scholarly perspective, it's extremely problematic because basically it's like if you have a list of, uh, of uh, 100,000 names and then you just basically just explain the work and deeds of 2,000 of them, right? Then it seems like all there is is 2,000 instead of there being 100,000. And this is kind of the, the discrepancy that you can see a lot of Jews get upset about, right? They get upset about because if you're just focusing on 2,000 uh, names and the specific details of what those horrible things that 2,000 people did. And it seems as if the 100,000 doesn't exist, right? And then it paints the picture for people that are reading books that are just filled in the deeds of, the, of that minority to then make it seem like as if it's the majority. And that's the problem, right? And that's the issue is that people talk about historical records and receipts and they talk about, oh, look, look at this 
this book says that all of these different people, this guy had this many this slaves, this guy had that plantation, this guy had this, right? We have the names, right? But then if you look at that and you compare it to the general history, right? All of the records, the collective records of the transatlantic slave trade, both in the in the in South America, Central America, the Caribbean, and North America, you then get the big picture, right? And the big picture is that these Jews were a minority of the uh, of the of, of what was what transpired in the crimes that were committed. Now, that being said, right? When we're talking about individuals that did do something and we have the record of them first we have to understand that majority of those people were what we call the Muranos, right they were jews that had already uh, bat were baptized they were uh, allowing themselves to be presented as christians in order for them to do trade in the new world because these european societies had actual laws on the books which prevented jews from coming to the new world to to work and trade and that's why I mentioned the specific history of the uh, expulsion of, uh, of uh, the Jews from the French islands, from Brazil, from Caraco, from uh, ultimately uh, Union Savannah was destroyed because Jews were fleeing from there because there was also persecution from the European authorities, right, against them. So ultimately, a lot of these Jews ultimately ended up assimilating into Christendom, into Europeanness, right? Um, so it, in that way, sense, it's difficult to kind of trace them. But for the people that we can identify, for example, the descendants of Aaron Lopez or Jacob Rivera, right? These are people that we know their names, right? We can find those people's, you know, these their descendants, right? Today, then of course, you'll be hard pressed to find a Jew, right? Regardless of his uh, diaspora uh, ancestry uh, community that would take issue with that, right? We're about justice. And we're ultimately, you can see when you're talking about what happened with uh, Germany, I have to correct a little bit of, of something that, uh, that you said about the Holocaust, right, and about uh, what happened uh, in the 1930s. What happened in the, what the Nazis did was not simply an assault on uh, and, and a genocide against the Jews of Germany, right? They wiped out basically what were ancient communities that were established from the Roman period of Europe throughout Europe, not just in Germany. But in Poland, in the area of Ukraine, in in all of oh, in Italy, right? There was the Roman uh, Hebrew community, which they have records from being descended from the people from the were brought to Rome that are depicted on the Arch of Titus. Those those uh, Jews, right? They call them in in, in Italy. They call them Hebreo, right? Those Hebrews were taken and slaughtered in the concentration camps in Poland and Germany as well. Um, uh, and likewise. Uh, ancient uh, Sephardic communities that were in Greece and and, um, and throughout uh, Central Europe were completely slaughtered. In addition, the Nazis had it, all, all this stuff. They recorded everything. They also had in-depth in uh, uh, details for plans that they had to set up death camp in Baghdad to completely massacre um, um, sorry, Mizrahi Jewry, um, to, uh, to put a death camp as well in Jerusalem to slaughter the entire uh, Jewish population uh, in the land of Israel. And also when the Italians invaded uh, Ethiopia, they also rounded up all of the Jewish population, all of the Beta Israel population in Ethiopia, and were planning to do exactly the same thing. So the, we're talking about ultimately is a crime that was committed against the collective Hebrew people in those in that region, in the old world. Um, and so that's why something which was viewed with such gravity. Oh, and I forgot to mention also the gas trucks, which did slaughter uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews in North Africa um, during the Holocaust. Um, so ultimately, when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, justice, restorative justice in terms of the um, basically making uh, the crimes and the wrongs of history right, obviously, right, we need to be allies of each other because ultimately what we're talking about, right, if there were people that did evil things in our history, right, and we know they were, right, if those Sephardic Jews, right, and I know you agree with me on this issue, right, Sephardic Jews were descendants, right, they had total long trees tracing them back to specific villages and uh, and uh, parts of, uh, of Judea and Jerusalem, right, that those descendants of Israel did something that was wrong, did something evil to people, uh, some of whom were certainly... Hebrews themselves, right? That's something that we need to obviously uh, have a total con a, a total um, reconciliation with, in the sense of people who did something wrong, right? They need to be completely condemned, right? And being that it's an aberration of our uh, of our values as Hebrews. Um, in addition to that, any descendants of the individuals that uh, that benefited uh, from that should obviously be uh, held responsible. That's not something which is uh, controversial. 
Okay, cool. I'm I'm glad you admitted to that. Um, you can you can hear me now, right? Right, and also I do want to say because at the end of the day, those people that uh, those individuals like Aaron Lopez, Jake Rivera, they're ultimately they're your brothers as well, right? They're, they're, it's not like brothers in the sense like oh we have camaraderie in the sense that they're descended from ancient Israel just as you're descended from from ancient Israel. So ultimately, when we're condemning them, right, the connection between uh, uh, the uh, the for example the Ashkenazic Hebrews and the, and those Sephardic Hebrew individuals and you as a, as an African Hebrew uh, in America your connection to them is is also existent right so ult ultimately it's not to say that you know we're talking about um, you know a collective guilt where we're remitting what we need to do also we're talking about recognizing as Hebrews that we have bad apples in our society and, and ancestrally and today right and those are people that we need to we need to condemn understood understood gotcha okay so um collectively there needs to be condemnation um in regards to the particular uh uh families involved investigation should be made for restorative justice like you said so some form of um reparations can be divvied out to those who have been directly affected by that um, I think that it's important for us to reevaluate that, right? Um, and be able to see, you know, what needs to be done in order to close the gap, in order to build uh, any form of trust or additional trust uh, between various communities. You know what I'm saying? Black communities and communities that they, that, that certain black communities who have not well traveled or well studied believe that, you know, their Jews are all one monolithic uh group of people, right? Or a uh, homogeneous group of people. Uh, but the 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 next question, I'll, I'll, I'll segue away from here just so that way we can save some time and allow um, everybody else to to uh, ask a few questions, make a few statements before we close out. Um, but the last thing I did want to bring up to you is that um, you had made a statement earlier that um, I think we may have, we might have a point of contention. I'm not sure. I got to see where you're your position is at in regards to this, but um, you had made a mention in regards to this ecumenical approach that we need to take in regards to unifying uh, Jews in a diaspora with Jews that are there centralized in Israel. Um, and this is why we are looking at the various, um, you know, Ming Hagim and figure out, well, which ones, you know, if we are united that we really should apply based on our environment um, and being able to come under, you know, one particular uh, ruling group that is responsible or acknowledged uh, as a Beit Dean in that general Jewish community um, and go from there. The, the, the issue that I have in regards to that is I'm not a huge proponent of um, an ecumenical type of, you know, position, you know, and the reason why is because, you know, you know, just like there are, you know, some uh, Jews who are Zionists, who are at odds with some traditional Orthodox Jews in regards to, well, who should be doing the regathering, right? Should this be a political thing? Should this be a divine thing? And look at it like that. Well, from my position, I feel that this regathering that is done um, should really be left in the hands of the creator because he was the one initially that caused the dispersion, right? Caused the scattering as we can look in the scriptures and see the evidence for. And because of such, I think we should lay it in his hands. So I don't necessarily, this is my opinion, uh, see anything wrong with any, you know, Israelites in the diaspora developing their own communities, running their own communities without binding themselves to rulings of another uh, community of Judea. Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello. Hey, well, I lost the volume on you for a second. Can you hear me? I can't hear you, but you're breaking up a little bit. Hello. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, and I think you probably pick up. Uh, one of the things I want to bring up is just uh, you know, oh, he dropped off. Okay. Hopefully, he can come back. Hopefully, he'll get back on. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up is Zechariah chapter 10, verse 8, where the Most High is saying, you know, um, I will whistle for them and gather them in, for I have redeemed them. 
and they shall be as many as they were before. Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me, and with their children they shall live and return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria, and I will bring them to the land of Gilead and Lebanon till there is no room for them. Now, to me, I think that that's extremely key because this goes to show who is the agent responsible for the scattering and the agent responsible for the regathering. Right. So this is why I'm not a big fan of this ecumenical push in regards to uniting all Jews or people of Israelite ancestry or across the border, because the way things are now, there's a huge schism. And that schism that's there right now has divisions in regards to customs, economic positions, political positions, social stances um, and, and status, you know, uh, color. And if you want to mention it by color, I mean, all of these things are dividing points that prevents a ecumenical uh, regathering in the hands of man. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, of the scattering, so many different things have occurred and that those communities that are scattered are responsible for their own salvation per se of getting their communities together so that they would be set apart or Kodesh for, you know, the creator, yod heh to come and then relocate them on his own. When man gets involved, things are sketchy. We see, you know, a lot of schisms even in the land of Israel today. You know what I'm saying? With various groups that that claim to be Jews and they're at odds with one another. It's because this is something that was initiated with the establishment of the state of Israel and trying to regather these Jews um, from various distant lands and, and, and bring them back into um, on the land of Israel. So that's something that I am uh, totally against. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a proponent of that. And this is one issue that I have uh, a point of contention that I have with uh, groups, Jewish groups that say that, oh, we need to come under one banner and we should have, you know, one set of rules and uh, one set of protocols and how to follow Torah. And, you know, we should incorporate, you know, in regards to the uh, oral Torah as binding and what the sages have said uh, in regards to what's binding to all of us as Jews. I'm in total disagreement of that. Right. I'm, I'm not a fan of that. And the reason why is because because of the splintering and the scattering that was done by the most high, there's so much work that needs to be done. It should be left to him. And I'm a fan of groups being autonomous and independent and working out their own issues and being able to reestablish themselves. Right. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for him to come back. I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but this is why I say that, you know, first we uh, as African-Americans in the diaspora, we need to connect with um, our kin in West Africa. Right. That is identified with Israelite lineage. So that way we can have a comradeship first because we have shared experiences. And then from there, we may be able to have political ambassadors uh, speak to other groups outside of us. But that's where the immediate affinity needs to be first in regards to establishing a bridge. And then from there, you know, then we can create diplomats and ambassadors to go and speak to other groups. But that's just my opinion. I don't know. Hello, can you hear know. me? Oh, you're back. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Sorry, I got uh, my phone died and I got uh, kicked out, but I'm back. Oh, it's okay. I missed. A, I'm sure I missed a lot of uh, gems. Do you want to? I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll sum it up real quick. So I was just saying that, um, you know, I the only point of the main point of contention that I have with something that you said is in regards to this ecumenical push uh, to bring all Jews together, and that all Jews, even with their differences, should be able to find common ground or a common denominator. Um, in order to better walk out, you know, what was given to them by heritage. Um, I'm, I don't I don't hold that position. I don't feel that, you know, we should be the ones responsible, you know, doing this ecumenical push. I believe that should be in the hands of Hashem. It should be in the hands of the creator because he's the one responsible for the scattering. You know, and I had brought up a reference in the Tanakh in uh, Zechariah chapter 10, where he says, I will whistle for them and gather them in for I have redeemed them. And they should be as many as they were before. And he goes on to say, though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me. And with their children, they shall live in return. I will bring them home from the land of Misraim and gather them from Assyria and bring them to the land of Gilead and Lebanon. So there's no room left for them. Right. So I think that that's my major point of contention in regards to uh, I think one of your positions in regards to this ecumenical regathering 
uh, in order for us to, you know, establish this unity amongst Jews worldwide. I believe that it's okay for groups to be autonomous and uh, for groups to establish based on the principles and template of Torah to establish, you know, protocol, right? Or halakha that they believe uh, is applicable to their immediate communities, right? Um, because in rejoining with others, there's been so much damage and, and differentiation has been occurred through the scattering, it's going to be an extremely difficult process to get all of these in the diaspora on one accord. So uh, just please give your final opinion on that. And from there, I'm going to open up the panel. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, ultimately I can respect that difference of opinion. Um, and, and I just uh, I do want you to understand, though, that the reason why I view it in that sense, right, in the sense that, you know, ultimately our goal is to be united is because clearly and i don't think you would dispute this that the visions of the prophets and the visions of our ancestors was that ultimately the tribes would reunite that we have this kind of theme all the way from bereshit all the way into the end of the tanakh of this conflict between the northern israelites and the southern israelites right between the northern tribes and judea and this is something which is a repetitive theme throughout our history but the ultimate goal and this is, seems like an unambiguous goal of the, the vision of our ancestors and of, and of the Torah is that we would reunite. Now, you then stipulate that that has to be done by Hashem. And the response uh, that, I, that I come for that is basically that, you know, Hashem works in many different ways. There isn't one cut and dry formula from which we see Hashem's interaction with uh, humanity and with Israel specifically. You have your kind of very uh, revealed and obvious redemption, um, you know, that happened when we were taken out of Egypt, right? And you also have the redemption of the return from Babylon, right? Which was done by human beings, right? Ezra and Nehemiah were, were leaders, right? They inherited the, the traditions of, uh, of Daniel and Ezekiel, and they, and they, th with, they believed they were acting with through Hashem's inspiration, right? To then lead a revolution and a restoration and a unification of uh, Judean life. Um, and so likewise, right, when we see what, how the way we, we interact, right, and again, another example, that would be the book of Esther, right, with the story of how we were redeemed, in a sense, from the persecution of Haman, right, Hashem's name isn't mentioned once throughout the book of Esther. Does that mean Hashem wasn't responsible? No, of course, he was certainly responsible, just that he's responsible for everything, right? So ultimately, we have to see whether it's consistent with our, with our values, right, the values of the Torah, and, and that's how we then correct ourselves, because ultimately the redemption of the Jews from Babylon back to the land of Israel was not done in the most perfect way, but it was done. And it was a reality of history. Right. And likewise. Right. While I certainly respect uh, Jewish communities, Hebrew communities that are existing outside the land of Israel and that are committed to living a Torah life. Right. And there's, there's, there's they have that within the Sephardic sector, the Mizrahi sector, the Ashkenazic sector, the African Hebrew sector, right? This is certainly a theme, right? This idea of wanting to create a Torah life in uh, the diaspora until the final redemption. But we have to recognize that in the land of Israel today, we have an unprecedented regathering of the people, right? This is whether or not you think that this happened exactly the way it should or it shouldn't have been done. This is a reality. You have Yemenite uh, Jews interacting with Jews from the, that came from Tunisia, the, the uh, return of exiles from, from the lands of the north in Europe, the return of exiles from Ethiopia. You know, you have Igbo Hebrews in Tel Aviv, friends of mine, right? You have, we, we're, we're seeing a, a return of people from all over the four corners of the exile. This is a reality. And when you see the people living that reality, right, again, with all due respect to the communities that continue to exist in the diaspora, again, I'm not saying that their existence isn't valid. It is valid, right? Um, but what I am saying is that when we're living together, right, just for practical purposes, we create this fusion, right? We create this fusion. In, in Hebrew, we call it mizuga galuyot, right? This, this bringing together of the exiles to create this new Hebrew culture, right? And so it's not new in the sense that it's a rejection of our ancient uh, ancestral uh, inheritance. It is the full embracing of that inheritance and the adaptation to our new reality. That's basically what it is. And that's, uh, that's my perspective on, on the things that I wanna to continue to see, not only in the land of Israel, and they're seeing it every single day, I'm living it every single day, um, but I wanna see it uh, also with, with my brothers and sisters that continue to live in the diaspora, and that includes you, 
and that includes uh, your community that you're building. And I don't think that we this is a time for us to be dictating how each another should live. But I do want to create um, some type of parallel, right, with, with what you were talking about earlier. And that was the situation of the various groups in uh, within the Igbo society, right? You said you have your the Hebrewists, you have your your Rabbinites, and you have your sa your um, sab Sabbatarians, right? If, if I believe that is the the terminology, right? right? And right. I'm 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 deeply familiar with all three of those groups, both in terms of the academic research on them, but also in terms of actually knowing people that belong to all of those groups, right? I have mm -hmm. good friends from each of those communities, and Same we here. have to understand is that the Rabbinite group didn't appear out of a vacuum, right? What happened is is that you it, within the context of uh, the anti-Semitism that Igbos faced within Nigerian society, right? Which was this intense hatred of them for being conniving, being conspiratorial, being controlling, taking advantage of their privilege, right? All these things that everybody's familiar um, from the, the anti-Semitic uh, um, diatribes of white supremacists and even uh, people from, uh, from uh, the Nation of Islam was, is also in the, the mouths of, uh, of radical uh, Fulani herdsmen that, uh, that kill um, and slaughter Igbo Hebrews to this day, right? So they were dealing with that situation. They also had to deal with the intense Christian uh, missionary work that was done by the British, right? And so in rejecting that Christian missionary work, which was so deeply influenced, unfortunately, tragically, Igbo society, you have all these, these various responses, right? And so while certainly the, Hebrew, uh, the Hebrewists, right, the people that are talking about Omenana, and the, the power of Omenana, Omenana and the ancient uh, tradition of Omenana, they also felt that they had, were losing uh, people consistently to the church, right? And so the Sabbatarian movement, right, was a huge move away from the church. The problem was is that the Sabbatarian movement for, in their view, right, wasn't creating enough of a break. And so that's why and I've, sp I've spoken to the people that founded the Rabbinite movement in uh, Igbo land, and they told me, right, the reason why we do this is because, again, it's not to say that we need to reject our Omenana heritage and our customs. Uh, exactly the opposite. We take those customs and we take the, the teachings and the learning and the, and the studies um, and the traditions of, uh, of Judea, right, of the halakha that was developed by Judean exiles, and we use it to enrich our society and to give it content. Ultimately, right, I don't think that the, the, the ideal is a situation in which that um, culture that Omenana is replaced by customs of any other uh, Jewish Judean community. I certainly don't believe that. I think that ultimately what's important is that Omenana is, is revived in its entirety. So that way we can, we can examine it for its experiences, its contribution, uh, from it, for its inheritance, of uh of israel's uh legacy today and, and yeah and that's this conversation yeah and and that's and that's what remy ilona is actually doing that's somebody that i'm partnered with um and he's written a lot of the headway work in regards to that right he's been doing it since the early remy, 2000s. Is a, remy is a good is a good friend of mine for many years mm -hmm. I've, I've walked Correct. with him on the, in the streets of jerusalem together mm -hmm. so he's he's done a lot of work in regards to that to kind of put it out there so it could be parsed out and compared right to the overall um israelite community um in regards to that so i'm gonna I'm go ahead and just end off here and i'm gonna open up the um the discussion uh so a few people can get a couple of questions and statements in um but i know you have made a reference in regards to you know there being a humanistic um element in regards to uh, Hashem working to regathering his people. Um, and I guess in some cases, you, I guess you can say that, but like if you look in the, the rebuilding of the temple uh, after their uh, time in uh, Babylon for 70 years, uh, you did still have Nevi that still went out and still told the people from Hashem to go and do this, right? So it was sanctioned also uh, from Hashem. You know, we see that uh, through the prophet Haggai that he actually brings that out where the Most High is speaking to him to regather uh, the Israelites that were getting, I guess, full in Babylon. Because, you know, they created cities, al Yehudu and various other small cities there where they were actually waxing fat. And um, it was time for them to actually leave. Yem Yahu, the prophet Yem Yahu, also encouraged the people to leave out of Babylon as well. So you still had the Nevi'im that was still there 
uh, working uh, under the auspices of divine inspiration by Hashem to gather the people and, and, and actually get them to move uh, based on what his directive was for the children of Israel at that time. Right. So I, I just just a quick comment. You can make it as quick as you can. What is your take on there still being prophets that are still encouraging uh, these situations to occur in the history of the Tanakh for these returns to occur and these interventions? I know you made one reference to Esther and you see there's no mention of Hashem in Esther. Um, but that is that that work is a, is isolated for a reason. Right. And there's this academic um you know exposés on that to explain why we see that as being something a little bit unusual from the rest of the thread uh of the ketu beam of the writings um but in regards to the nebaim and the prophets actually you know trying to get the people to come and to move you know we still see the involvement of the hand of hashem you know in these situations what is your take on that and then i'll open it up after that yeah, sure. Just real briefly. Ultimately, the, the way, obviously, Esther stands out, but it stands out, right? And this is, again, this is also a scholarly consensus because it's also the most modern of the, of the texts right. of, of, uh, of the Tanakh. And the reason why it's modern is ultimately look, we're, a pro we're a product of, this, of, of all the things that happened, right? We are, we're the product of the Israelite exile, the, specifically the Judeans, of everything that happened with the Judean experience under the Persian uh, empire, and that is what the story of Esther is. Um, and in terms of prophecy, right, we do see that for that whole period, we have this kind of the closing of what we refer in, Jew in Jewish tradition, the closing of the prophetic period. But prophecy is a complex issue. It's something which um, the innumerable amount of ink has been spilt by Hebrew sages and scholars of what exactly that concept is. And the idea that uh, Hashem works through us is something which is very clear throughout uh, not only the Book of Esther, but the Tanakh in general, right? Before Moses, before Moshe become, gets uh, his interaction with the burning bush, right? Before he has that, he has to go through his own personal awakening, his own personal uh, realization of what's going on, right? And it takes a personal action on his behalf. He has to leave Egypt physically before Hashem meets him at that place. And again, this is, an, this is a subject of an entirely different, more longer, more complex conversation, perhaps. Correct. And is how do we see Hashem's hand in current events in modern history? And I, I would certainly make the argument, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of not only um, uh, not only uh, Ashkenazic Hebrews and Sephardic Hebrews and Mizrahi Hebrews, but also African Hebrews, right? And I don't mean I don't mean just Igbo, but I also mean African American Hebrews that have returned to the land, right? And African American Jews also see Hashem's hand in uh, the events of the, not only of our ancient history, but also in the events of uh, the modern world and in the reestablishment and of the mass return to Zion that we witness um, in, the, uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, so what I wanna say is thank you for your time, Yim Yahu. I'm gonna open up the panel for about 15, 20 minutes. I know we went a little bit over on time, um, but if you have another 30, do you have another 20, 30 minutes to um, speak with the people? Certainly, absolutely. And again, I wanna say again, thank you very much for having me on the show. Definitely enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, correct, correct. And, and, and we can actually continue to set this precedent on how these dialogues should go. Uh, with two communities uh, that may seem on the surface to have a perceptional um, adversarial uh, odds the way it would be perceived in the media. Um, but when conversations like this are had, when there's a mutual respect, um, even in the midst of a disagreement, uh, also can look at some of the commonalities. It makes for a worthwhile discussion for the audience that's listening. So uh, I would love to have you on the show again at a future time um, where you can pick a topic, I can pick a topic, and we can kind of make it a little bit more formal, structure it so we have either amount of time to speak on it um, and present whatever resources we have. And I think that that would be extremely educational for the listening audience and the viewers on both sides of the spectrum. Absolutely. And I would definitely like to take you up on that. I just want to say one last thing uh, with some, sure. to close out the discussion before we open up to questions. And that's that this, what we're doing right here, the reason why it's been so rare is because it's not easy, right? It requires a certain level of, uh, of uh, reducing one's ego, uh, kind of putting aside one's uh, uh, prejudices, right? And uh, emotional experiences to be able to kind of look past what the, what it, the illusion is and see what the bigger picture is because ultimately it's very easy for people with, with particularly with our with our painful history as dispossessed 
exiled, you know, we're the product of all of these things, of thousands of years of persecution, exile, suffering, right, and dispossession. Uh, it's easy for us to use our traumas uh, and, and to use that as an excuse to keep a barrier between us. And that's exactly, that feeds in ultimately uh, to what the, what the enemies of the people of Israel want. They want us to stay separated. They want us not to have these conversations because ultimately, as long as we're separated and we're not having these conversations, we don't challenge or we don't successfully challenge the status quo of the world. And I don't think that I need to spend a lot of time to let our, your, you and our listeners know that the, the world as we know it is in a very terrible, complicated, painful state. And it's waiting for us to, to make the change that we're supposed to. I agree. I agree. OK, well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for for that feedback. So I just shared the link. Um, so I'm waiting for a few people to jump in, which I see a couple of people are here already. And um, I'm going to give them an opportunity to, um, you know, either make a comment or a statement or ask a question. And then um, from there, um, what I'm going to do is just uh, allow you some time to respond or me respond, whoever is directed towards. And then we'll close it out in about 20, 20, 30 minutes. All right, so let me go ahead and um, open it up to the first person that uh, clicked on um, and give them about two minutes or so to either make a statement or ask a question uh, so we can move through the panel because there's there's several people that just jump, jumped on just now, all right? So the first person is, I'm gonna add on um, uh, my brother, Kyle. Kyle, are you there? Yo, what's up, bro, how you doing? I'm doing good, man, what's going on with you? Man, cool, cool. Hey, peace to the brother, man, from Israel. Um, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a, a good discussion. Um, I have major contentions with a lot of things that were brought out um, because I'm, I'm not sure if it was just incorrect information or errors or it's just blatant um, misinformation that's being disseminated. And I would like that to be corrected by one or two guys that were actually talking. Um, and about the Igbo people, the Yoruba people, and you know the West Africans, um, y'all are making this assertion that these people are Hebrew Israelites or whatever y'all want to call them, and that's just absolutely false. Um, you know that, Ron. I'm sure his brother knows that as well. What you're misleading people, setting up a paradigm that that leads them to believe that these people were indigenous to Northeast Africa when they were. And by doing so, you're, you're trying to make it. Can you get your mic, bro? If you don't mind, the other person that's on the back. Uh, but you're, you're making it seem as if slavery that happened to us African Americans was somehow um, not done by Jewish people. When, when we look into Benin, we can look into Besosa. He was definitely a Jew. He definitely was the leading producer of slaves for uh, you know for South America. Uh, we can go into the Portuguese. We can go into the Dutch people. Like all these people had stakes in our enslavement, and you're trying to minimize this, saying they only had a certain amount. Um, and you're, I, I feel like you're doing that by saying, "Hey, it's okay because these Igbo people were Jews," and I want y'all to correct that because that's not correct at all. It's not. And I'm not sure if you just don't know or if you're blatantly just lying to people. Okay, so. Um... Yim Yaho, you want to address that first and give yeah, your sure, and then I'll and I'll um since you're the guest and then I'll respond to his question. Okay, all right. Yeah, um yeah. no problem. I'm a um I appreciate that, Kayao. I'm gonna drop you off um right. so that I can open it up for one last person. And then um, you know, next time we do have a live stream where me and him have a discussion. If you have another question, whatever, just click on the link and you can jump in. All right. Yeah, no doubt. Peace, bro. All right, peace. All right. Uh, go right. ahead, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Kyle, for the, for the question. Uh, first, I, I definitely want to reassure you that there's definitely no intention for misinformation. Um, we just definitely have a very different perspective on the facts, right? And, and, and that's not to say that you can't or I can't or anybody can't uh, point out, again, individual, like you point out, I, I didn't hear specifically what the name was, but there were individuals, like I said, Aaron Lopez, Jacob Rivera, right? The, there's no doubt that we can point out to individuals, particularly in the Portuguese and Dutch, mo, the Dutch more than the Portuguese, uh, uh, period of the uh, transatlantic slave trade and point to individuals that were Hebrew, right? Again, I'm not saying that that's not a fact, right? What I'm saying, though, is that when you focus on those names, right, to the exclusion of the vast majority of names of individuals that were involved in uh, in, in investing and in profiting uh, and enslaving, um, 
that is what is the injustice here, right? So ultimately, it's not to excuse anything, right? What was done, anybody that was involved in the slave trade, whether it was at, at, in any type of involvement, was committing something that was evil, right? And we need to judge them for the, those evil actions. But when we then take, again, if let's say you have, and this is, again, you can check the, the research on the subject. I'm not making something up, right? If you look at, the, everybody likes to point to the book that was released by the Nation of Islam, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, right? The book is full of names, right, of Jewish names. And again, if you take uh, all the scholars that have criticized the work, because this is how scholarship works. You have somebody that releases a piece of uh, scholarly information, and then you have somebody that has that either corroborates it or criticizes it. If you read the criticisms of it, and I urge you to read the criticisms of the work, it's not they're not saying that those people didn't exist, that it's fabricated. What they're saying is that when you take all of those names and all those facts, all those statistics, and you compare them to the collective statistics that we have from the transatlantic slave trade, right? Whether it be in the United States or whether it be in the Caribbean and in South America, what you then get is the bigger picture, right? Which is that those Jews who did evil things, right? Were a minority among the people uh, that were collectively responsible for the slave trade, right? Um, and that's again, one little point of this is that ultimately the vast majority of people that were enslaved were brought well, over in the uh, 1830s and 1840s, not America. when the uh, the Dutch were were heading the slave trade. That was when the British had already taken uh, the reins in terms of uh, this horrible uh, tragedy um, and evil act of history. Um, so that's that's as it relates to the slave trade. Um, when with the whole issue of the Igbo people, and I'm sure I'm I definitely would like to let Ron take this question more. Um, I'm. I understood from your question basically that you're saying that Ebos aren't Hebrews. That's what I understood from what you were saying. If I'm mistaken about that. No, no, no. That, that is what he's saying. That is what he's saying. Okay. So, okay. So first of all, you need to, again, so I'm assuming that this is coming from the place that uh, there is a popular notion that um, basically Hebrews in West Africa were rounded up by all the non-Hebrews and sold to the Arabs who then sold them to the Europeans. And that's basically what happened. Again, I, I know that this is something that was promulg uh, promulgated uh, in certain points in recent history and in certain camps of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the BHI movement. But I have to say that the historical records and, and Ron will back me up on this does not corroborate that narrative, right? What we do see is that West Africa, right, West and Central Africa, like West and Central Europe, were complex places with a confluence of societies and civilizations, right? So what, we, when, what happens is when European explorers and then colonialists come to West and Central Africa, what they're coming on is not a place where everybody's living in peace and harmony, which is kind of like the, the Eurocentric notion of, of African history, no. We're talking about advanced civilizations and cultures with complex uh, and competing narratives and interests. So that led into a lot of inter-tribal uh, and inter-kingdom warfare in the region. And so that meant that you had Igbos that were enslaved and Igbos that were also enslaving. It's not, again, it's not a cut and dry situation. So that's why you had Yorubas that were enslaved, you had Igbos that were enslaved, you had Akan people that were enslaved, Bakongo, again, the list goes on and on. And not all of these nations were, had the same origins, not all these, these nations had the same regional interests. So this all fed into the situation which we had this confluence of uh, cultures, of, uh, of peoples in the African diaspora in America. Um, and that's basically the situation we have today. So when we, when we look at uh, Africa today, we look at Nigeria today in Igbo society, Right. And I'll let Ron focus more on this because I, I don't want to take up the whole question. But ultimately, you can't look at Igbo culture and civilization and society and say this isn't Hebrew society. Right. And I'll let Ron take it from there. I wanted to respond on what you said, though, before he goes to something else, because I definitely didn't like what you said, because uh, that, that right there, what you said is from a backdrop of, of white supremacy and racism man, for, for people. Okay, what, what about that was uh, white supremacy and racism? Well, it's a false predetermined notion of how somebody's keep muting me. I'm not. Uh, so, no, no, no. I, I'm I'm muting you, Battle Axe, because you're you're coming out of step. All right. No, you're I'm gonna saying I'm saying I didn't like that, and I wanted I wanted to straight the facts too. Because and you that's will not, get that's your turn. Correct. Hold on, listen. You will get your turn. 
Okay, just just chillax for a second. Let me move through the panel. When I come to you, you can respond. That's all. All right. So Yim Yahoo, just hold off on that. When I get to him, if he if he has a question, comment, or statement, I'll give him an opportunity to say it, and then we can go from there. All right. So please follow protocol. Battle Axe, I don't have a problem. Whatever you want to say, whatever question you want to ask, but I just need you to be patient. All right. So all right. Ron, I do, I do want to say like I have twenty minutes, right? So um, fine, that, and that's what I'm saying. That's why that's why I wanted to go through everything real quick, everybody real quick, okay. and and go so I knew you had limited time. So I just want to respond real quick. So in regards to what Kyle said, Kyle's concern is that there were uh, in his in his position, there's a multitude of Jews uh, and Jewish families that were responsible for setting up a lot of the trade routes in which slaves were traded. Um, if we talk about the um, the domestic slave trade that occurred in, in Africa uh, by way of the Arabs. And then from there, you know, the Europeans getting involved as well. And his thing is that, um, you know, why align uh, with these Jewish groups if they're the ones that help facilitate the slave trade in various ways? You know what I'm saying? So the first thing that I want to say is we have to be particular on who did what and not blanket statement everything. Right. Because just like I had mentioned that there were black Jews in Luango that has been substantiated by the uh, Christian Oldendorf's uh, report that he got from African slave that African uh, Judaic uh, scholars actually consent to say that, yes, that is an authentic account. They were not involved in trading any people. They had nothing vested in trading anybody. That was an isolated group that had nothing to do with that. So when we make everything homogeneous, we error into lumping everybody in the same category. I mean, the same thing can be said for the Sankai Empire. Sankai Empire was a West African empire that was is, it was influenced by Islam. And they also had chattel slaves, you know what I'm saying, that they traded and so forth, right? And these were these were West Africans that got involved in it, right? Who who some people say they was Islamicized, right? And then we go look at the Oyo Empire. The Oyo Empire also had slaves and was trading POWs and stuff before Europeans got involved and it had nothing to do with the Arabs. So I understand anybody that has an issue in regards to the families that we have documented that is um, responsible for the slave chain. What I try to do is, you know, people mention the Nation of Islam. I never mentioned that at one time at all. Like the sources that I'm giving are sources that is being used in academia. Like there's a book here from Capture to Sale, the Portuguese slave trade to Spanish South America in the early 17th century. And the book that was written in response to the Nation of Islam's uh, work, Jew Slaves, and the slave trade set in the record state by Eli Faber, these books were written in regards to responding to what we see the nation of Islam putting out because now what happened was the, the flames was put to the feet of these Jewish scholars to come and respond and to actually address who was responsible for the slave trade. So that way blanket statements are not made and uh, poor scholarship is not done in identifying these groups. But you'll see nobody who is an expert in this field in regards to uh, Jews who were slave traders or facilitated slave trade or even helped to establish and navigate people through trade routes uh, ever say that all the Jews that were there were responsible. Like that, that, that right there is not honest. That's not fair scholarship, right? That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is because of the various trade routes and because of the extensive recordation that we have of Jews migrating all over Central Africa, East Africa and West Africa, there was amalgamations that occurred all over the place. Just like we see any other Judeans or Israelites that scattered any other parts of the world, you tend to take on the visage of the people that you live around, some of their customs, some of their foods, and so forth. So now you have a situation where sometimes they can be phenotypically indistinguishable from each other, but then you have to look at actually the oral tradition of that group, look at their customs, and then go into their migration routes to see what, how can you authenticate that particular group um, as being authentic, right? So that's that's the thing in regards to the Igbo. You know, there is no written documented history of the Igbo. Now we have some stuff contained um, by some of the elders uh, because you know Igbo people have a secret society where they keep a lot of these details in regards to their traditions and their history um, from outsiders. But then you have other um, scholars uh, who are Igbo that do research and explain the histories of the people that also come out and admit that there is no documented history, which makes it very difficult to say whether or not. Um, they collectively came from here or they collectively came from there. My position is what I say all the time is it was amalgamation. You had 
you had people that were native to the region and you had migrations that came from other regions and they amalgamated. And over time, this is when you get to see enculturation occur where certain customs don't have a particular myth tied to it, which scholars say that it could be because it is a foreign custom that entered into the native populace, right? Or there was some kind of, you know, connection or communication or, or, or trade or something that occurred where certain exchanges of ideas, customs and practices had happened over time right to bring about what we see today so i'm never i'm not saying here sitting here saying that it was one homogeneous group that came over there and populated africa that would be fulfilling the oriental hypothesis as well as the mythic hypothesis that say that when they traveled there um they were the ones that populated that region and they also brought high culture with civilized the natives there because they were savages like i'm not a proponent of that i don't teach that and i don't purport that right so again it's layered it's complex and what we're doing is trying to extract the complexities in regards to people who are doing works on various fronts of scholarship in this realm whether it's african judaic studies by the experts in that field or even people who's doing africana or african studies in regards to native igbo yoruba or, or house of fulani uh scholars that are doing works in that field some of them say no you know that that authenticity of israelite lineage is is not correct there's some that say yeah it is because if we look at a b and c we can actually make a case for that so it depends on what side of the coin that you're on i'm familiar with both and my conviction goes to a particular side where i'm identifying with that particular lineage that does trace back to israel that's just my personal conviction right so that's why i just want to put out from there and that's what i just want to put on the table so from there i'm going to move on real quick um because i know we probably got 15 minutes left for yim yahoo and uh shepo i'm gonna let him uh he's next um shepo i'm gonna give you an opportunity to say your piece i'm gonna unmute you right now or oh, you're already muted so you can go All ahead right. and uh, All speak right. yeah um, th thanks, Divine, for, for letting me on. Peace to, to all the brothers um, on, on the panel and the, and the audience. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment, um, you know, particularly around um, one of the, the points that was mentioned earlier around um, matrilineal um, lineage. Um, so the perspective that I'm coming from is basically from a cultural perspective. I don't really want to argue points um, about you know, whether people subscribe to, to certain um, perspectives or not. But if you do subscribe to the perspective of, you know, certain um, African tribes and nations um, being from, from the, 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 the lineage of, of Israel, um, then th this would probably make sense to you because a lot of the, well, a majority of the Old Testament, you actually don't have to change cultural perspectives if you are reading it from, um, you know, certain indigenous um, cultures, particularly the Bantu. So the, the narratives are actually consistent um, with, the, with the cultural thought. So if you are someone who, who prescribes to that, then, um, you know, what you find is that within um, the society, you have to first understand how marriage works so that you can understand some of the texts, possibly around Leviticus 24. It might shed some light. I'm not necessarily saying that's how it is but it might shed some light. So what happens is that from uh, a marriage process is that marriage is, a, is an initiation that is actually conducted by the elders where the two people, um, the woman and the, uh, and the man who are married, they're actually initiated into a marriage covenant by the elders. Um, and that, that's a process that's then facilitated where usually the parents are not involved in order pr to, to preserve the, the relationship of the direct in-laws. Because as part of that facilitation, there may be things that are contentious that they need to then sort of iron out um, in making sure that, they, that they're marrying into the right family and that those people have a, a good foundation to make the, the marriage successful. So that's the basis of how you engage. Now, they, the, 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 the cases where you know, you find that once that person is married, nope. that our identity is through, um, you know, the paternal line. So if you ask me who I am, I'll tell you my name, but then I will also say I'm the son of so-and-so who's the son of so-and-so. And usually people in my community will have an understanding of who my father is and who my grandfather is, and therefore they'll be able to identify me. Now, we have two cases. So what might happen is that, you know, I might be somebody who was born out of wedlock. And if I am born out of wedlock, then there's a claim that is made to my father's family to say, here's a child. Do you then accept a child? And the, the father may not accept me. So mm. what would happen then is that my grandfather or my uncles, they would then um, accept me into my mother's family because my mother can't actually give me a name because she will then get married later on and she will change names. So mm. my grandfather on my mother's side, she would then, he would then facilitate that and say, okay, we accept the child and he would then give me the name. 
So when I'm growing up now, I'm growing up as a member of the family from my mother's side and how I would be identified in that family is through my mother. So they would say, oh, that person is Tepo, he is the son of, and they would then mention my mother because my father hasn't claimed me, but that doesn't mean that I am now subscribing to a Matrillion lineage. It's just how people identify me within that particular space. Mm-hmm. And my father's identity will always remain because within that household, there are certain roles that I cannot fulfill because I do not come from a direct line um, from, 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 a, from a male heir within that family. The other aspect is that if even if my parents are married, I might then, I've got certain roles that I need to fulfill on my mother's side. So I may have gone for a particular event or a particular function on my mother's side. She may be married and everything may be, have gone correctly. But when people ask me who I am, I would then also identify myself through my mother because those people in that community would have grown up knowing who she is. So it would be sort of, a, 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 they would be more familiar with her than my mother, uh, my, my father. So I would say, I am so-and-so, I am the son of um, this particular woman. And they might say, oh, the person who was married by. So some of it, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, to sort of apply a, a blanket thing to say, okay, there's a matrilineal lineage here is not necessarily correct if you do subscribe to certain cultural um, perspectives. Some of it is just a question of identifying who the person is, and some of it may be a question of how that person was actually brought into um, in, into that particular community. So it might be a question that the Egyptian father might not have claimed the child, or it could be that 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 particular woman, um, you know, that that son had come from his father's house and he was actually amongst his people for a particular ceremony or function. And his identity might have been delineated through his mother. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, mm. and, 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 and that's it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for that, Shep. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to drop you and just go to the next person because we're running out of time. Cool. But thank you so much for that. All right. So let me move Ron, on to the Ron, next do you person. Mind if I clarify something? Sure, sure. Yeah, if you want to dress up real yeah, quick, you can. Just real brief, real brief. I want to say thank you of, uh, to our uh, South African brother. I, I recognize the accent, and it's pretty cool to see that there's an international audience here. But just something real quick I want to clarify. When we say that modern uh, Jewish society, right, or Jewish society from the Babylonian exile onwards went matrilineal, it's kind of a misnomer, right? Because certainly, it's, I think a, a more appropriate description is what you said. It was a means of identifying within certain circumstances, right? Because to this day, uh, Hebrew society from the Judean uh, persuasion identifies also uh, value to the patrilineal line, right? And, and, and when I speak to people in Hebrew, right? When I'm in the synagogue today in Israel, I go around and people ask me what my name is. I say, my name is Yirmiyahu ben Micha ben Betzal ben Avram. I go, I can go, all, I can keep going, right? You go all the way, you say all the way your fathers are, right? The issue of the mother, Right is only again. It's for purposes of understanding what that you have the matrilineal link that connects you to the nation. So certainly uh, developments uh, that we talked about earlier, historical developments, made that uh, a point of emphasis for nationhood. But the patrilineal emphasis is still intact. Right, and then you see an interaction between both means of identification. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. All right. So um, let me get the next person. And then after that, I think it's battle access turn. So you can ask his final question. But um, uh, the next one is Deacon. You there? I don't know if he. You see a Deacon, unmute your mic. All praise to the most high. Shalom, you know. brother divine. What's going on? God. Well, good King. What's going on, man? Oh, man. You know, just tuning in and checking it out. <laughs> Uh-oh. Maker is here. All right, I'm gonna, you got the floor, man. You got a few minutes. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Good dialogue. Good dialogue. Uh, you're a, you're a Mayahu? Yes, sir. Okay, that's how you say it. Shalom, shalom, and peace. Shalom, shalom. Um, <clears throat> so I've been listening in. Uh, this is a just a general question for um, what what sect of, of Jew are you, if you don't mind me asking? I uh, definitely don't mind, and I don't uh, ascribe to any specific um, sect. Um, the if if by sect you mean like the what, what's referred to today as like reform, conservative, orthodox, those types of things. Uh, that also, and um, Mizrahi, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Khazarian. Right. Okay, so basically, um, the first I want to say when it comes to like reform, conservative, orthodox, that's all very modern. That's all very recent. These are all products of the European Enlightenment. 
And that was basically an intense pressure put on, on Hebrews in Europe by European society to assimilate. So mm -hmm. basically, when I talk about like spiritually, how I identify, I identify myself with the, what basically what I, I told uh, Ron earlier with the uh, rabbinic uh, Judean tradition, which was set uh, as a precedence in the uh, during the, after the Babylonian exile during the Greek and Roman occupations of the land of Israel. Um, ethnically speaking, on my father's side, we are uh, Ashkenazi Hebrews, uh, basically um, Jews that were taken uh, as slaves to Rome after the uh, after the uh, Great Revolt or Bar Kokhba, uh, and then from there migrated into the Rhineland area, and then from there after the Crusades. Right, we don't need to get into all the, the history of uh, of Central and Eastern <laughs> Hebrews, but that was basically that's the line of my family. And then okay. from there, they then, uh, with the, you mentioned the Vilna Gaon earlier, um, Ron, the, with the Vilna Gaon's community, they then uh, went to the land of Israel. And there they uh, married into a uh, family also of the Jews that had returned from Babylon, had returned from Iraq to, uh, to the land of Israel. Okay, so in short, uh, asking, okay. So <clears throat> do, do you believe that the Persian era was a captivity for the Israelites? So it gets complicated, right? In the sense that there are certain degrees of persecution, right? Not every single period of uh, existence in exile has been the same type of exile, right? For example, I don't think anybody would say that the level of, uh, of uh, suffering or exile that Jews were experiencing in Moorish Iberia was the same as they were experiencing later let's say when they fled into North Africa and then they had to experience persecution from the Almohads, the, the uh, Amazigs in North okay. Africa, right? There was, there was this kind of fluctuation, right? Of, mm. of, of kind of a, a tolerance, <clears throat> a suspicious tolerance of Hebrews and then followed by a horrible uh, reign of, of terror. And we can see this, this fluctuation of anti-Semitism throughout Hebrew history. It's a kind mm -hmm. of a constant. Um, and when we talk about the Babylonian and then the Persian uh, diaspora, what we see is a good example of this. You have the initial slavery, and then you see very quickly uh, the Judeans or the Jews in uh, Babylon rise up in the hierarchy. You actually see the first example of a Hebrew, a Judean-controlled bank, right, from, from records of that time period, right, because they were also situated to be non-landowners, which forced them to be merchants, which forced them to work with money, so on and so forth. Um, and then you see with the, with the rise of the Persian Empire, replacing the Babylonians and then Cyrus, you see the, the, the desire of Cyrus to then use the Jews as this kind of subject population, right? And it's not because Cyrus is, is spoken of very positively in the Hebrew tradition, right? He's even called Mashiach. In in, uh, in in one of in one of in our right, scriptures, yeah. right? And yeah. exactly. So so he so, but the, we have to understand though that Cyrus had his interests, right? And he was not doing it likely. Again, if we're looking at this from kind of like a more scholarly perspective, out of a love for Hebrews, he didn't love Judeans, right? Most likely. But what he did, right, is he saw, right? And you can say that this is kind of a way of seeing Hashem, how we're seeing God's hand in our in throughout history is he then used that opportunity to then say, allow the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple, right? Um, so certainly there was a period of toleration under the Persian uh, rule, but that tolerance ended, right? It ended uh, in, the eight, in the 800s, right? In the 900s, where we see a rise of the Zoroastrian uh, reformation within the Persian empire. And that led to, it's not spoken a lot. There's not a lot of history done, a histor historic uh, scholarship on this subject, but we have an intense period of anti-Jewish uh, persecution in the 800s and 900s in Persia, which basically led to the near destruction of what were the ancient Babylonian uh, Judean community. Okay, so in short, because um, I know it was supposed to be 20 minutes. In short, um, were they in captivity during the Persian rule, yes or no? Um, they were, cap I mean, Again, so no in the sense of like physical captivity. They were captiv captives in the sense that they had assimilated in many ways to the circumstances which they were living and they didn't want to have to deal with going back to the land of Israel with, with the minority of Judeans that went back to the land of Israel 
and have to build something from scratch. Right. Okay. So again, I don't think captivity is a black and white thing. I think because ultimately when somebody is, is brought somewhere by force, right. They didn't choose to come here. Right. So for example, we have people in the Caribbean, right. Marcus Garvey, this is what he was talking about. Right. Where, where during the time when Marcus Garvey was alive, you could through your own efforts, go get on a, on a ship and go back and join other Afro-Caribbeans and Americans that were going back to what they viewed as their ancestral land, right? Were they captive to it? I would say yes, in a way, because they weren't brought to the Caribbean. They weren't brought to the new world by choice. <clears throat> they were brought there by force. Right. And so now all of a sudden that they have the ability, the right, the legal right to leave, doesn't mean they're not captive to their own exile in their mind. Right? Okay. Slavery is in, in, in exile is first and foremost in our heads. It's not just okay. in our physical being. So did the primary forces of that time, such as Nehemiah and Ezra, confess or profess rather that they were in captivity verbatim we spoken? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Were they, did they, they definitely viewed themselves as returning to Zion, right? As, as leaving slavery. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying Nehemiah, after they, after the Babylonian captivity, being in Persian subjugation, Nehemiah and Ezra both say that they were in captivity ver verbatim. You're telling me that they were? That's what that's what they said in Nehemiah nine and Ezra nine. So, so right, so I'm I'm agreeing with you. So I don't understand what, what's the question. Okay, so is it possible that they can be in captivity and also um, have others in captivity as well? Is it possible that they could be? in captivity and have okay, okay so i've got I'm, I'm i'm not your question isn't exactly 100 percent clear so i'm i'm assuming what you mean by that is can they be oppressed and still oppress others right so, so did, okay so, let, so that's a question i can answer that right? yeah so not, not their own people but did they have specifically specifically just for time's sake did the israelites go back from babylon to israel and did they take babylonians captive so first of all, we don't have all the historical information from that time period. And what we do know is that that Israel, Judeans in Persia, in Babylon, were they were liberated from actual physical slavery very quickly. And that's what the, the archaeological uh, evidence corroborates that, right? I have to check on the sources if that included uh, bondsmen and, and uh, what we would call kind of indentured servitude or slavery back then. Again, I don't have that information in front of me, but I can check that and I can follow up with Ron later about it. But okay, no worries, no say, worries. what I can say is that what those Judeans, though, that left Babylon and returned to Zion, then became, for the Israelites that never left, very much the oppressors. They came back to Zion, and this is where we see this intense conflict and hatred between the Judeans and the Jews that never left, between the Judeans and the Samaritans, which were also northern Israelites that never left, right? We see the intense uh, oppression even, right, in the conflict between that group of returnees and the Israelites that remained in the land. So there was certainly a dynamic which then situated those returnees above uh, the Israelites that never left and would certainly be described as those Israelites that never left as a system of or a state of persecution and oppression. Absolutely. Okay, okay perfect. Last question. And I'll make it quick. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, yeah, after this, we got to move forward, uh, Deacon. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So the curses of Deuteronomy uh, in verse 28, um, captivity is a part of those curses, right? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, perfect. So in Deuteronomy 30, when it says he's going to gather all the Israelites and uh, in their captivity and then bring them to the land and then put the curses on their enemies or the other nations, when would you say that's going to happen or has it already happened? Which part? The part of the captivity or the part of the curses being on the people that had done that to them? Well, the captivity is part of the curses. So when he says he's going to put the curses on the other nations after he gathers the Israelites and bring them into their own land, has that happened or will that happen? Okay, we're going to leave it as the, the last the last question. Um, I appreciate it, Deacon. Um, and yeah, you can stay in touch with me if you want to get in touch with the brother. I can give you his information if you want to invite him on your show and y'all can have a dialogue as well because that way yeah. it'll be more fleshed out. Yeah. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Um, hello, Maki. All right, so go ahead, Yemi. I'm gonna let you finish that, and I don't know if you want to take one last question before you leave. But... Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll answer that question, and I'll take one more. Um, so okay. basically, 
um, when we're talking about prophecy, right? We're talking about the prophecies that are either in De- Deuteronomy or the books of our prophets, right? There's a lot of we, there's a lot of room for speculation. Now, there's a lot of things where we can just look at what historical facts were, right? We know as historical facts that in the immediate uh, the, uh, aftermath of the destruction of the temple, the Great Revolt, um, even during the period when Pompey invaded uh, Judea in 63 BCE, uh, and in the, bar, in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba world, we have historic records from Josephus, from historian, uh, Roman historians, showing that there was a massive enslavement and dispersal of Judea, right? So again, this is, this is there's clearly the, what Deuteronomy is talking about isn't only what happened in the Roman exile, it's also what happened in the Assyrian exile, the Babylonian and the Roman, and it goes on until today, right? This is not our relationship with Nevu'ah, right? With expressing what has what happened in the past, what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future, right? If we're going to use the Hebrew terminology, is an ongoing process. It's not something that's set in a fixed way. That's more of a Christian perspective on the way the prophecy should be viewed. But what we do see certainly, we're talking just about the Roman exile, is a mass enslavement of Judeans and the dispersal of them throughout. Uh, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the entire Mediterranean basin. So that was all of North Africa, right? That was all of Southern Europe and Central Europe. It went all the way up to, to uh, Britannia back then. And we can see already from first, uh, second century, third century, fourth century, the enslavement, not just the presence of uh, Judean refugees, but also the presence of Judean slaves. We have uh, even uh, um, inscriptions on, uh, in Greece from the third century, right? That's pretty late in, uh, in history of a slave to a Greek master. And then we have evidence of, of what happened to those communities afterwards. So certainly we know that the inheritors of the Roman legacy, right? Which is Europe, right? They um, are certainly responsible and they continue to be responsible. Not in something that just happened in the past and then they stopped. They continue to oppress, subjugate, and as you say, put, in, uh, you know, uh, enslave even and put in captivity uh, the descendants of Israel and Judea. Um, and uh, in terms of whether or not uh, the time has come for them to face the, you know, justice for everything that's done, that's, I think that's more complicated and we can discuss that in a later date. But I think in many ways, part of it has, has begun, but it's nowhere close to even to being finished. Absolutely not. All right, cool. I appreciate that. So let me, um, Oh, well, what's your name? Just dropped off. He was next. Battle Axe was next, but I guess he just dropped off. So um, I'm going to have to go to the, the next person. And from there, I have to I'm gonna have to let Liam Yahoo go. But whoever else is on the panel, you will have an opportunity before I shut down the show uh, to give a, a question, a comment, just in general, if you want. So we can close out with that. So the next person is um, Yim Yahoo. Please say I don't know who that is, but. You can unmute your mic. Is that Yah World <laughs> Yo, yo, Yeremiah, yeah, please say to Yah. What's going on, brother? What's going on, King? Yo, man, peace to the panel, man. Um, I, I kind of had a question on um, um, because you 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 talked about um, stretching uh, your ancestry back to Babylonian captivity. Um, this is really a question on the um, on the appearance of the ancient Israelites um, during those times. Is this a situation to where Israelites looked more of a European persuasion, and then they went into Africa and then amalgamated with the people there? and took on a more of an African, so-called African appearance? Or is it the other way around? They had uh, more of a melanated uh, persuasion than they went to Europe and took upon a more of a European appearance. I would kind of like you to speak on the original appearance of these people because when we look at the scriptures, we know that the uh, people like Joseph and, um, and Moses, right, uh, was placed in positions, uh, high ranking positions in Egypt and being considered Egyptians themselves. Yeah, you know I, I, the ancient... I can answer. Yeah. So, okay, so first of all, I think, I think it's very important to mention, right, the fact that 
a lot of, and I, I mentioned earlier in the show that the fact that a lot of uh, Jews of diverse, diverse backgrounds are not familiar with certain things within uh, Jewish history or within world history is not something unique. People from all different communities are ignorant of their own history and ignorant of their own scholarship. This is across the board. Now, and this is a good example of that, right? The, uh, the Hebrew texts, whether we're talking about the Tanakh itself, but even more so the uh, literature that comes from Judea and has been maintained by Jewish communities throughout the world, whether they were in Babylon or in uh, Europe or in North Africa or in Ethiopia, it was, it's very clear that the ancestral population of the Jewish people was a melanated ancestral population. That's not something that's ambiguous. It's just not focused on because the focus on, and I don't need to tell you this, everybody knows this, the focus on color specifically, on phenotype, is a European obsession. It's a product of white supremacy. Prior civilizations did not focus on that, certainly not Semitic civilizations or Hamitic civilizations. This was not a focus in Middle Eastern slash or North African society, right? This is something that we were forced to deal with as a result of our enslavement here in America, right? That's, that's, that's a reality. And, and so, and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but in terms of the, 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 uh, the skin color specifically of uh, the ancestors of the Jewish people, this is not something which is ambiguous. There is a discussion of skin color in the Mishnah. Again, the Mishnah uh, is a text that can be, uh, is traced back to the original, right? Oral law, the original halakha, before the exile, right? Before the Babylonian exile. Um, and so there's a discussion there on this color, the skin color of the Israelites during the time of the Exodus. Again, if we didn't care about skin color, why are they talking about skin color? Because they were talking about the laws of tzara'at, of leprosy, right? And so that's why it was relevant. And the reason why they're having this discussion, though, in the Gemara, right? Because the Gemara is the part of the Talmud which just discussed the inherited uh, law from before the exile, right? And so in that part, why are they having this discussion? Because already in the period of 200, right, before, during the Greek occupation, I'll put it that way. During the Greek occupation, you already have an influx of different peoples. You have influx, and this is clear throughout the historical record, of people from Cush into the land of Israel, and you have, in, you have influx of Greeks, right? So already at that point, you see that there is through this admixing, you see that the, uh, that the population is getting lighter, right? Um, but still overwhelmingly a melanated population. And of course, Israelites that were then exiled, uh, you know, into, in, fled into Africa, you know, they went into populations that were as dark or darker than them. And then Israelites that were taken into Europe in chains were then obviously surrounded by a population that was lighter than them and through admixture then became lighter. That's just, this is just an issue of fact of history. So that... Uh I mean, that that's, one, one, a concern of mine. Uh, that's a concern of mine. Be okay, no, no sweat, no sweat. Um, that's a concern of mine because it's not a, a situation to where uh, it's uh, white people that are using white supremacy uh, to to. Um, to whitewash the Bible, you understand, we have a lot of so-called Jewish people that are in high positions in Hollywood, high positions in a lot of uh, uh, what you would call the corporate world that are behind this so-called, what you're claiming to be white supremacy, right? And what they're doing to the, the, um, the, the Bible within itself when they're doing uh, renditions of, of the biblical text itself. So, I mean, I, you, you have to take that into consideration because you, you, are trying to minimize as uh, that there's so a small group that's doing these things, uh, then you and then you link it up with white supremacy, but yet and still these are the, these are what these are people calling themselves Jewish, All right? So right, I, I, that, that are doing these things that, that are behind brother, you, this pushing, not only changing the color. Brother, you mind me responding? So I'm just how are you equating that? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. All right, thank all you. Right. So uh, first all right, Yim Yahoo. Of all, hold on, Yim Yahoo. Um, Yim Yah, I'm gonna let you go. I appreciate that, Aki. Um, thank you for yeah, tuning go ahead, in. Go ahead. 
participating. So I'm gonna let him uh, round up, and I'm gonna say shalom to you. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, floor is yours. All right. So, Thank so you. go ahead, Yim Yahoo. You got it. Appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the question, and I think it touches on a lot of kind of uh, preconceptions that a lot of people have on this specific issue. But first, I want to say that I'm in no way trying to minimize right the the uh, negative effects of of this internalized white supremacy, right? So this is this is the major distinction I'm making. And first of all, I want to say that I reject the use of the term so-called Jew, right? This is something which I find deeply offensive, um, and for the following reasons, right? Ultimately, when we look at the history of uh, Hebrews in Europe, right? What we see is a very painful, violent history of oppression and persecution of an ethnic group because they were viewed as non-white, as non-European. This began in what I said, what I said in the Spanish Inquisition with the process, with the uh, law of limpieza de sangre, the concept of impure blood. And it went on and developed into certain uh, ideas that kind of came to a crescendo in Nazism, which described Ashkenazic Hebrews, described Ashkenazic Jews, right, Israelites, they use those terms interchangeably, as non-European mongrel race. That's how they described uh, Jews in Europe, right? And the reason why, and the way that they did that is they had all these caricatures, you can look up Nazi propaganda, uh, uh, anti-Semitic propaganda, where they depict Ashkenazic Jews as being darker skinned than the general population, generally speaking, as having certain Africoid uh, features that were identifiable, what is called as the Jew fro, right? This different fe facial features, everything, right? They were just, they were derided and despised for their Semitic Afroasiatic ancestry, right? That was what they suffered under, right? And so this was something, right? Even though obviously this was, di there was a different dynamic in America, we can talk about that. But in Europe, right, the Jews, right, the Jews that were Sephardic or Ashkenazic Jews, depending on the context, were viewed as the single, aside from the Roma population, the single non-European population in the continent. And they were persecuted on that basis, right? So obviously, right, what came with this was also a huge level of internalized racism, right? I, talk, I talked about how this process of racial anti-Semitism began in the Spanish Inquisition. In that same time period, we can already see within the Sephardic Jewish population internalized self-hate. Right. One of the very famous rabbis of that time period in his writings, he's describing his Jewish brothers and sisters and says, because of our sins, we have been cursed as being darker skinned. Right. He's talking about Jews in Europe, that we are the Europeans look at us as being dark skinned. The reason why we're dark skinned is because we sinned and the Europeans are light skinned because they are not being judged yet, but they'll be judged later again. We could get into what what that all that theology it's kind of, it's it's connected to the hermetic hypothesis. We can, that's a very deep subject for another time. But what I'm saying is that what we're talking about ultimately, we're talking about Jews who have in, uh, uh, internalized racism, have internalized uh, white supremacy, and have used that to then uh, you know insult other people because of their appearance or because of their background. It's because of internalized racism and colorism that they were subjected to for thousands of years. Right. So it's something that it's 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 not as in the sense that, OK, let's look at what the white supremacists are doing. It's not uh, the same system, white supremacy. Right. It still continues to still continues to persecute them. Right. So it's way more complicated than that. OK, awesome. I appreciate that. So what I'm what I'm going to do with that, Yim Yaho, I'm going to give you um, a, maybe about two minutes to close out and I'm going to close out before hit the four hour mark. I apologize to the two other guests that we had on the panel. I just want to minimize it on the four hours as much as possible. Um, so that way people don't get freaked out when they see how lengthy the discussion is. So uh, Yem Yahoo, I'm going to give you two minutes. Uh, you can just sum up everything and um, I'm going to go ahead and close out. So you got the floor. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to start off by saying thank you very much to Ron. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, our conversation. I enjoyed interacting with the people. Um, my intention coming into here was definitely not to preach. It was definitely to uh, maybe teach a little bit, but also learn a lot. And I do think I, I learned a lot from uh, your perspective. Um, and I enjoyed uh, the process of iron sharpening iron. Um, basically, the message that I want to relay to, uh, to the listeners and, and to yourself is that I think we should view uh, Hebrew history as this constant interaction, both with our heritage and our inheritance, but also with the nations around us. Because ultimately, the purpose of Israel, the purpose of, 
of our nation is to be Ola Goyim, right? The light unto the nations. And we do that by number one, being true to ourselves, but also understanding the state of the nations around us, right? And so if we think that the exile didn't happen, uh, you know, for naught, right? That we learned lessons from our interactions with the nations, that we learned lessons from our persecution, right? And from our constant fighting within our nation, between each other, right? Then ultimately we can learn how to come back together, how to take the lessons learned from our history to create a better future, a better future in which uh, 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 the descendants of, uh, of Judeans and the descendants of northern, uh, of northern Israel, right, can once again unite and then create, uh, to create the, the nation of Israel that our ancestors dreamed of. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much for that, Yim Yahu. I appreciate you for joining uh, tonight's discussion, um, for being as upstanding as possible, being respectful, being tactful, and being able to uh, be astute and objective in regards to uh, conveying your worldview and your perspective. So I truly appreciate that. I look forward to a future dialogue. Just let me know what your schedule is because it's kind of busy as well. And um, we'll do something that's more formal, more structured, and something where we both can supply a topic and be able to get enough time and resources to unpack. All right. So I appreciate your time, um, Yim Yahoo. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me again. If anybody wants to reach out to me, has a question, wants to build further, uh, yes, you can please, look me up. Yes, give your contact information. Absolutely. You can look me up at uh, Yim Yahoo uh, Danzig on uh, Facebook. Um, the spelling is Y I R M I Y A H U Danzig D A N Z I G. Or alternatively, you can also uh, look me up on Instagram, and that would be at J. Elia E L I Y A H. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, my brother. Um, and shalom. Shalom, shalom. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, family. Um, thank you, everybody who. Uh, came in to the chat today, came in and watched the live broadcast. I know it's like early in the morning. Some of you probably got to work in a couple of hours, uh, but you took some time to check this out. Um, just so you guys know, this was not a debate, right? This was just a discussion, right? It's my first time meeting um, uh, Yim Yahu and um, having a build or a dialogue with him. So what you guys are witnessing, uh, you know, before we had the back chat discussion, uh, before we went live, it's just me and him actually speaking really for the first time, you know, aside from our correspondence via email. So um, I had a couple of points I wanted to get out, a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Um, and because he wasn't, you know, truly diametrically opposed, I mean, I can nitpick at some things he said and point out some points of contention. Um, I wasn't really prepared for this type of dialogue, right? I thought it was going to be somebody else uh, who had a more diametrically opposed position, but I realized the brother striving to be as tactful and objective as he could. Um, coming on a platform like this, and um, it was a little bit, you know, for me, I was just wasn't expecting that. But however, going forward, uh, when we have a follow up discussion, I already know from taking notes, uh, like a particular topic that I would select out um, and give him an opportunity to do the same. And then from there, we can have a more structured discussion, like you know, the one you saw with So Real, uh, where we freestyle first, and then we have the more structured, and then we went in with the more structured discussion. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining out. I think at the end of the day, you know, my objective uh, is restoring, uh, restruct, reconstructing and restoring culture uh, back to our community so that they're more close-knit, so we can become autonomous and self-governance, and uh, we can keep things in-house. I'm going to leave it up to Yah to do the, you know, in-gathering of the nation of Israel, and that way he can sift uh, and find out who's who's who. Um, so I'm going to leave that out to him. In the interim, um, these dialogues are necessary for the betterment of the community so they can see two opposing sides and they can make the judgment for themselves. And typically with these type of shows, I like to give the guests uh, a little bit more time so they can unpack things. And then when we get to the second round, two things will be a little bit more structured. All right. So thank you for everybody who joined the panel. I apologize to the two other people that was on the panel. You know what I'm saying? Uh, sorry that I had to drop you guys. But again, I was trying to save on time. Because uh, we are about an hour over time, um, and I'm trying to end this in the next minute or so. Uh, but please, family, if you guys want to support, you see right there in the ticker the support information. If you want to reach out to me, the email address is also in the ticker. All right. Um, also, the you know Yim Yahoo left his contact information. Uh, you guys stay tuned for next week. We have another Power Pack Freestyle Friday coming up 
uh, well, actually coming up this week, I'm thinking this is Friday. It's not even Friday, uh, coming up this Friday. Um, and then if I could squeeze in another live stream before then I can, I want to show some of the information that I have for today's discussion. I wasn't able to disseminate, but hopefully in uh, future live streams, I'll be able to share that uh, little by little. So thank you for everybody for joining in the chat, man. I love you guys. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for all your support. Shout out to the new Patreon members, man. You guys are now part of this exclusive family. You know what I'm saying? And those of you who are wanting to sign up for KHM, also check out. We'll be in DMV. Uh, yeah, I will. And hopefully sometime by the end of this month. And um, for anything else, other inquiries or any other things that you guys are interested in, email me at kingdomharbinger at gmail.com. Hit that thumbs up on your way out. Hit subscribe if you're brand new. Share this video everywhere. And family, I will see y'all again on the next live stream. Peace and shalom.